day 12 of the faculty day faculty development program and we have been seeing so many domains in the last 10 11 days and today we are moving to two domains one is nyudh kala that is martial arts in the first session first half and in the second session we have two army officers great army officers who will be taking us through military sciences so in nyudh kala martial arts we will go through sources text schools and thinkers all together we have combined the two topics that we are doing it separately in many of the domains here we have combined it and we have with us dr dk hari and dr dk hima hari from bharat gyan i have known them for more than 10 years they were in the art of living ashram we were we were all staying in the art of living ashram and they have done lovely work and they are currently based out of chennai hmm? a little introduction about them dr dk hari and dr dk hima hari husband wife duo are founders of bharat gyan a forerunner in indian civilizational study to compile and present knowledge about the indian civilization and its global connects over millennia through an indic narrative they have 20 years of professional experience in management and it see their background it's management and it and how they have started bharat gyan and done so much of work through bharat gyan they started bharat gyan research around the year 2000 and they have so far collated over 500 hours of multimedia content in over 108 different subjects and published 100 books as part of autobiography of india collection besides five documentary films 500 plus short films 500 plus blog articles isn't that a big achievement right it's such a vast achievement this this tells us the quality of their minds and the quality of their seeking they are visiting faculty for indian knowledge systems in universities in india and overseas as well as for fdps they have been a part of our fdp since 2020 when we started this series and i'm sure you will really really enjoy their session thank you dr hari dr hima hari for joining us on sources texts schools and thinkers in martial arts that is niyudh kala welcome thank you thank you so much dr richard chopra for uh, in introducing us to this wonderful group and to uh, keep calling us year on year uh, i'd also like to acknowledge and thank all our senior uh, faculty professor kapil kapoor for uh, his uh, blessings that's always been with us in our work uh, in in the field of iks hey, so Uh, we'll get on to the subject of the day that is martial arts in that word itself there are two common one is martial which is yuddha and there's arts to it kala so yuddha itself in can... yuddha it becomes therefore <laughs> so it's beautiful because uh, you're going to be having the session in the afternoon by people from military itself and uh, you will be exposed to what really goes on in a battle now when we talk about niyutta kala uh, here it is yes it is an aspect of combat but here we are focusing on close combat so on foot because in battle you could be on tanks or horses and so on but in niyutta kala you are focusing more on close combat where the people are on foot close to each other and engaging each other in a duel and when you take it to a kala so the civilization the beauty lies in how even something which is to be fought we have made an art out of it so there is a kala aspect also to it and when you talk about kala i just share my screen here so when you talk about it from a kala point of view and especially something which is so uh, such a physical activity 
it takes you all the way the spectrum ranges from your own basic fitness to keep your body fit to your personal satisfaction you know like when you overcome your own records or when you overcome your opponent and you feel that satisfaction yes i have the strength in me to a spiritual experience itself now why do we call this a spiritual experience this is where the aspect of niyuddha in bharat comes into play because if you want your body to excel and that has been a beauty that the civilization has understood that if you want your body to excel you have to align all the layers of your being right from your mind and everything you have to focus and bring it into alignment to be able to perform and when you bring it to that kind of alignment because spiritual experience is all about aligning so in yoga you align as per the word yoga yug jug so this alignment join so in martial arts people experience that kind of a spiritual experience as well because everything is so aligned you have to be totally focused and totally internalized with that aspect so this entire range of using an act such as combat also to take you all the way from a routine fitness activity to enjoying a spiritual experience this is a beauty which you get only when when it's a kala because in a kala you are actually doing a routine act you may be stitching many many stitches or doing strokes that is a physical routine activity but inner your mind is focused on the theme on the idea and you are trying to bring out certain expressions for example mahatma gandhi used to say spinning the ch- the charka itself was a meditation for him even though it's part of the weaving kala okay so that is just one example we thought i'll bring out here please go so therefore uh, we have evolved by we have taken it as a combat we have also evolved it into an art and it is part of our 64 arts as well see the the aspect is uh, uh, there are in india through the ages if you see among the kala we have spoken about 64 different kala and the key point is it has not been the same 64 across centuries what the 64 is always varied and changed sometimes it's gone up to 72 and all but the key point is that this land recognized a variety of kalas and it was a very skill based land and all these skills were trained and honed and practiced and exhibited for the benefit of the civilization repeatedly by different people that was the underlying factor because when kalidasa speaks about 64 kala somebody else speaks about 64 kala each one is not the same list of 64 each one is different some some, some sometimes partially sometimes substantially different But the point is that there's a such a large range and we also have to identify for our times the range of skills that we have could be 64 could be much more too so so from and why did we uh, hone this particular skill of niyuddha you have yuddha why niyuddha as well because there are different situations which warrant different kinds of tackling and in niyuddha they have focused both on uh, taking care of fighting the threats to one's own physical body so how do you keep it fit and that you can do by exercising and an exercise with a, a purpose and one of the purposes there was also to keep you fit to what threats to the society and civilization itself so always keep the people in a fit condition so that when there are threats to the society they can stand they can come up while they by and large will be a peaceful society when there are threats you should be able to stand up and defend for you can be a peaceful society only if you exhibit strength so you must have the innate strength both in the physical body the mental makeup and the grouping that you are and show the strength to maintain a sense of balance and peace which is what in war is called the 
level of no deterrence or deterrence strength that's important this was this is not a new war strategy that, that we have in the last few decades or the last century or two this was been practiced in the land for millennia and the constant reminders actually today if you see to this aspect where uh, the civilization had emphasized on fit body and a able society you can see it in uh, the reminders today are are akhadas the traditional places where such training is done uh, north i think many people are they are familiar with the word akhadas and all but if there are people from the south uh, it is the word akhada uh, are uh, in for kerala it is like a kalari so a place where training is done and today we still are fortunate that we have a few of these traditional training centers still left now tracing back the history therefore if you see since when have we been practicing this niyudha kala it goes back way way back all the way actually uh, we have put this up as an article i'll show you where it is um, just a moment i'll pull it up she just showing it's in our website all of you can go anytime at your convenience later in bharat gyan we put the same the, the the substance of what we are going to what you're speaking the, the next hour and a half it's there in in our website just go to the bharatgyan.com website we're showing you how to get there itself so that you can do it next time as well so go to our website here you will find the blog So you search on Niyudha. Sorry. See, so you get to Niyudha Kala there. The full article uh, that explains the whole process, and and if you look at it, one of the earliest practitioners of this Niyudha Kala. so one of the earliest practitioners of his, of this new the kala see if we can trace it all the way back to parshuraman can okay, trace it can trace it all the way back to parshurama see parshurama what is the legend of parshurama he got the malabar and the konkan region he retrieved the region the malabar and the konkan region isn't it for all of us so that's why that area is called uh, parashurama kshetra even though when you do sankalpa for different places of the land we have different kshetra for the malabar and konkan region we call them parashurama kshetra of course now the tourism department has uh, has called it god's own country they adapted it well to be appreciated but fundamentally that is that's a kshetra what did he do after he created the parashurama kshetra see uh, obviously parashurama has got a kshatriya bhava he created 108 kalari centers means the centers for where you have these practices of martial arts he created them in kerala uh, which is present day kerala so and many of them actually even now exist from those hori times now if you see the times of rama is about 7100 years ago So this Parshurama, see, Parshurama makes his last appearance in in Rama's time, and then he is off after that. So that means this goes back even before that. So we have a Hori tradition, a practice in this land of this martial arts going back seven thousand one hundred years plus. I don't think any other civilization is able to trace its antiquity of different art forms. Let's leave that for a moment. Let's focus on. our subject of martial arts and see very clearly a continuity of tradition from there on now the point is where all did parshurama go around obviously he went to janakpuri uh, there uh, uh, it's all there the story of ramayana he went all over different parts of the land and wherever he went 
he set up these Akada centers. That's been one thing that he has done. And not only has he traveled in this main part of Bharat, he has got all the way up to northeast. In the almost easternmost district of Arunachal Pradesh, you have a nice kund, uh, Sarovar. It's called Parshuram Kund. And it was in this Parshuram Kund that Parshuram did tapas during Shankranti in his times. Which is why even now, every year for Shankranti, lot of people, yatris, go all the way out to Parshuram Kund, even though it's very cold then. In Arunachal Pradesh, uh, northeast part of India is very cold in Shankranti times, but still people go there to do Dhyana at Parshuram Kund. So that speaks about what? The range of the land from southwest border of Bharat, Varsha, where uh, he retrieved the land for us and called it Parsham Shetra to Parshuram Kund in northeast Arunachal Pradesh. He has traversed the land all over, setting up different kalari or akadas, as is now called in different uh, languages. That is how he created a base for it. So if you today, if you have this vibrant martial arts in this land, I think one of the early, early, early proponents whom we must all offer our obeisance to is Lord Parshurama. So from Parshurama, if you come down next, you will find sure that the next epoch, a milestone epoch, has been the Mahabharata. Oh, sorry, I am not sharing. I am sharing. One second, just share screen for you, please. So you can see parallel as you're talking, you share screen. One second. I think we need screen sharing facility, please. No, we are there. Why is it coming? We are there. Okay, we could minimize. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So from uh, Ramayana period, and pre-Ramayana, the next epoch, if you see, is the Mahabharata times. And we have so many anecdotes in the Mahabharata about duels that have been fought. And one of the earliest, even though it is not directly in Mahabharata, but is of the same contemporaneous period, but finds mention in Bhagavatam and all of that, is the engagement of Krishna and Balarama in duel with Kamsa and his warriors. So Chanura and Mushtika, how uh, uh, Krishna and Balarama fought when they were young with these people. And that was also a combat which is recorded. And mind you, the reason we can use this is because these are our documents of history. They, are our, they form part of our Itihasa, the Mahabharata period. We have called them Itihasa. I'm sure you would have had sessions earlier which... Uh, Emphasize this aspect of the knowledge base of the Indian knowledge system, which is uh, which are its historical, traditional historical texts, which have been called itihasa, meaning itihasa asa. It thus happened. So, which means that there were people, Krishna and Balarama, who engaged in such niyuddha kala. And Mahabharata, we can trace it, the timing of the Mahabharata period, we can trace it to at least. 5,100 years ago and therefore from then on it has been coming and uh, we have not only Krishna and Balarama but we have even in the amongst the Pandava and Kaurava we have Bhima and we have uh, Duryodhana who are all uh, extolled for their immense strength. See Niyodhakala needs strength and uh, while some of them are very subtle and need a light body some of them really need uh, strong, well-built people as well. And strength is therefore core. 
and it is very very interesting uh, that if you go to many of the akhadas uh, one of the divinities one of the main popular divinities in all of the akhadas will not be your warrior god skanda that is or kartikeya or the god who is very huge like ganesha with his elephant head but it will be hanuman and this is the beauty in indian knowledge system you know we may talk about niyudha we may talk about kala we may talk about itihasa they all blend together because they all each one fits in with the other and reinforces the other and where do you find the reinforcement for using hanuman as a divinity because hanuman if you see yes you have all the vanara and hanuman who have engaged in a uh, lot of their uh, uh, kind of uh, fights we call them just as fights or vanara fights when they fought for rama and uh, lanka but why particularly hanuman and how do you see the association you see that very beautifully in the shloka for hanuman where you extol the uh, traits of hanuman and then you say buddhir balam yasho dhairyam nirbhayatvam arogatam ajatyam vatpatukvam cha hanuman smaranat bhavet so balam dhairyam nirbhayam so all these qualities this is separate you even today so many of us when we pray to hanuman uh, we go to the temple we utter the shloka we say the shloka we pray to him with this shloka and all these words come in and all of us even today encourage our children to say the shloka for getting all these qualities which are definitely very essential for a martial art person and uh, hanuman and his uh, control over mind and the speed of mind uh, is hanuman uh, embodies that particular aspect as well and niyudha kala martial arts is everything to do with controlling the mind and the body together and anchoring them together to give you that strength to uh, make the impact now i will say about hanuman let's look at the kings of hanuman that is vali and sugriva they are also very skilled in this art of physical combat which is what they had a personal physical combat which all of us have, have heard about the vali sugriva yuddha so it has been a regular training across millennia not centuries across millennia but look at the other part of it what do we call if you go to olympics or international sport wrestling today is called by the greco roman style the style of wrestling itself they call that but they don't call it anymore indian style of wrestling whereas wrestling malyuddha is something that we have offered the world before those civilizations became civilized in the first place this is 3 4 5 millennia before the greco roman civilization formed itself we have been having rules and methods and trainings and practices for wrestling akadas and kalari and all that but we don't have that name in international sport calling it indian style of wrestling whereas you call it greco roman style of wrestling that is something through these efforts we need to change no use saying what happened 40 50 years back but sufficient time that we all look at the idea and then change and say okay we have an interesting indian style and we have the tradition for it and we have the data to to back it that's what is important so from the mahabharata period we then come to a period where we find all this martial art traveling actually from india so uh, he was hari was just mentioning about how we need to bring this particular aspect of uh, indian style of wrestling and these indian martial arts they actually have traveled the world over especially to southeast and one of the main personages who was responsible for this is bodhi dharma and this bodhi dharma he was a pallava prince so bodhi dharma so he was a pallava prince and he lived during this 
uh, 5th century CE. So Pallava fundamentally meaning this part of South India. And from here, so he lived in Kanchipuram and he was trained in Kalari by uh, gurus from Kerala. And from here, he has traveled, made his journey all the way to... Uh, so he was also a Buddhist scholar and uh, he wanted to take Buddhism. His main objective, his purpose was to take Buddhism and spread it to uh, Southeast Asia, China. And that is why he, his aim was to travel to China. And this was the route he take, took. He went along Malacca Strait, went to Vietnam. And he, spent, if he spent a few months in Vietnam teaching martial arts there. And he was known as Bode Dat Ma. Look at the name he gets. He had a, he, he had a different name in India. Of course, he was a Pallava royal prince. So he was a Verma in India. Uh, and then from there he went. He, he took. So this name was mentioned different ways. Whereas in China, he is known as Damo and uh, in Korea, his, even though he did not go to Korea, his skills went to Korea, his teachings went to Korea, they had become Dalma, then in Japan it became Daruma, so while he settled down in Shaolin, his skills from there on went westwards and came all the way up to Tibet, as uh, Dharmottara, look at the word, so, so it's all related to Dharma, see, while from Kanchipuram up north, he did not go into Tibet. Of course, he went up to Nalanda and studied all that. But his fame came all the way from Shavolin. So that's how it came through. And instantly, we have written a book on this. It's available in our uh, uh, site for all of you for free reading. So if you go to our mini book section again, you will find this on Bodhi Dharma. So this, this book talks about how he took martial arts. Who was he? and his background and how he took this entire so like we said in the earlier part about dhyanam so from dhyanam it became dhyan and then it became chan look at that in india some part it's called dhyanam some part is called dhyan when bodhidharma took it to china what did they call it they call it chan in, in chinese language and from china when this went to japan So it went there it and Zen. it became Zen. It became Zen Buddhism. So today when we speak about Zen Buddhism, so realize that it came from this particular idea. So he goes to Shaolin and there he emphasizes. So while he has gone there to spread Buddhism, teach Buddhism, he also emphasizes that it is not enough to have just spiritual, meditative uh, form of lifestyle, but you should also have physical activity to build your fitness as well and keep yourself as a fit society. Because China, uh, at the time, there were a lot of uh, group, uh, different clans as well, uh, trying to, uh, having engaging in uh, taking over each other's villages and so on. So he was, he was teaching people how to be a fit and uh, secure group. So, for towards this purpose, he taught them the martial arts that he was an exponent in. And uh, that is how he set up Shaolin. So, he was given the land to set up the Shaolin monastery. And he, prior to that, he proved his mettle by uh, he himself sitting and meditating. And uh, at, there is a cave which is called the Dharma Cave, Bodhi Dharma Cave. So in this we have detailed and you can read this later at your leisure. So that's how they normally show him. They show him sitting there in meditation. So he proved he had both the spiritual, the dhyana skill and the skill of techniques of martial arts. So how he convinces the emperor and that's how he gets it. Uh, 
and there is a monument for him at the place uh, even today. There is a monument for him specifically now for this particular, which is looked at as the the high place for martial arts. While we don't have a similar pagoda in India, China has it. That's a, so they are taking it up. So what is a skill of Bharat? China has gone and owned it today. Because we need to own back. First, there are three levels to it. One, we need to know about it. Then we need to own it. Because only if we know something can we own it. Only if you own it can we flaunt it. We can speak about it. So there are three. Unfortunately, we have not. We have stumbled a lot. Not a bit. But we have to get back to know of it. To all these IK sessions like this. Then own it. Then only you can say that yes, we have it. If you don't say, they will give others names to it. And there is a very interesting story as to how this style of Namaste, which is popular in Bharat, goes and becomes the style of a single-handed uh, greeting uh, in Shaolin. That is the way they greet people in Shaolin and in martial arts in China with a single hand, with just one handed namaste. And there is a very interesting uh, story behind how one of his uh, students uh, actually brought this out. It's a long story. So from here, we actually go on to the next. Just one. So, if you see Bodhi Dharma, the place from which he embarked on his journey to China was Mahabalipuram. Uh, which is there in present-day Tamil Nadu, very close to Chennai. Uh, it is a coastal town. And the name for Mahabalipuram in Tamil is Ma Mallapuram. And Ma Mallapuram, again, this comes from one of the Pallava kings who was a great exponent in martial arts. And he was, so therefore Malla, he was a Ma Malla, Maha Malla. So, Mal Yuddha, when you say Mal Yuddha, the same. Mal, you prefix it with a ma meaning great, maha, great. So he was a ma mallan. So the king had a had a prefix, a royal name called ma mallan. And the city that he built, the port city built, came to be called as ma mallapuram. So that was the importance it was given to. So, Mahabalipuram is the place from where Bodhi Dharma. So, this, this is the place today. You have an ancient shore temple uh, which stands there as a port city because it was also a very, very important center then. Uh, there were parallel uh, trade ports just along close by and uh, there are a few temples today. It's a very popular visiting site. And the most interesting thing is, China recognizes that this art has come from India. And uh, that is why when the Chinese premier, Xi Jinping, came to India, he chose Mahabalipuram as the venue for his meeting with Prime Minister Modi. Actually, we have made a short film on this. It's in a YouTube channel for you to watch later. See, when, when Xi Jinping, the president, came to India of China, he chose to come to Mahapalipuram, Mahamallapuram, because he felt that is they were their, their roots are. So while we have to exhibit our roots, whereas they wanted to claim that root. That's the beauty of it between the two civilizations. Look at this. Clear sculptures of wrestling that we have here, different forms. Is coming inside Kerala later. So from here, actually, let's look at some more 
of the various art forms. So from there on, things have propagated. And today, if you really look at it, we have various forms of styles which are particular to various regions of India. So if you look at the Northwest, we have, so we, we will start, we will look at different regions. So fundamentally, the point, actually at this point, what we want to emphasize to you is that there is a great history of martial arts, which, which goes back to Parshurama times. And we can see the trail all the way up to Bodhi Dharma, who takes it from India to other parts of the world as well. So we have got, come thus far. Now, what has happened within India? Do we, where all do we see traces of it? And when we talk about martial arts, while we use the word Niyuddha, we use the generic term Mal Yuddha, there are various variations and varieties of this. See, when we talk about war, Yuddha, there are two words that come uh, popularly which are used. One is the weaponry that is used in Yuddha. And that is Astra and Shastra. Right? We all are familiar with the words Astra and Shastra. Mahabharata is uh, full of uh, these words. What is the difference? Why do we have two words, Astra and Shastra? So, Astra are missiles. Those which are projectiles, they are sent out from one place and they go and cause a damage or inflict injury or effect in another place. So that's a, it's a projectile, it's projected and it's projected with a clear focus and with a definite target to hit. Shastra are those which are held in hand and fought. So these are weapons which are handheld weapons. You could be like sword, spear, bows, arrows. These are called Shastra fundamentally. And even within Shastra, we have varieties which are, that can be held, which can also be flung. So things, they are called Mukta. So those which can be freed from your hand and thrown away. And a Mukta, those which cannot be thrown, which cannot be freed and have to be held only in the hand and fought accordingly. You can't just throw a sword. You have to hold it in your hand and fight. Where there's a spear, you can throw it. You can hold it in your hand and fight. You can also just uh, throw it. And when you throw it, you can throw it in many ways. There are things which are called mantra mukta, which have been discharged by mantra. And you have yantra mukta, discharged by machines. So things like catapults or, uh, or tanks, uh, cannons. Which, which can release the ball. And uh, so there is a device which you use to uh, release the particular weapon. So the, this is all there in Dhanur Veda. Uh, one fundamental aspect uh, which we should bear in mind when we are trying to study uh, the traditional Indian martial arts. See, it's very easy to write about a science, about a philosophy and you can write pages and pages and explain the idea. But when it comes to activity, how do you write and explain about an idea? You can write about the sciences. You can write about the classification. You can write about the category. You can write about the objectives. You can write about the purpose. You can write certain, certain uh, tips about uh, various guidelines. But the actual technique... You cannot write it down. How much will you illustrate? It has to be learned in a Guru Sishya Parampara only. So a Kala is that which transcends time and comes down to you. It is a perfected art and comes down to you fundamentally by transcending generations as well. By transcending many brains, many mouths, many bodies. So different, different gurus from each guru to Sishya. Sishya, Sishya becomes a guru, then to his Sishya. So unless you have a guru Sishya parampara which is established and is functioning and flourishing very well, you will not be able to sustain arts, any form of art. 
So any kala to be sustained needs that kind of a Guru Sishya Parampara because it has to be demonstrated, it has to be physically taught. Even online, it's today we are uh, fortunate to have certain uh, mechanisms like the online systems that help us teach various art forms. But even then, you still need that Guru's presence, close enough presence to own it to a finesse. And therefore, we have various texts. So, Dhanur Veda is one such text, but which talks about the overall aspects of these kind of warfare techniques. But the actual way, the skill has to be learned from a Guru Sishya Parampara. And that is where we have had many such. Every Akhada, therefore, is one of that example of that Guru Sishya Parampara, which has been coming for so many years and has been, therefore, imparting this kind of training. Akhada or a Kalari is that kind of a place where uh, you have this. And based on all of this is where we have Which one? So from there you have various varieties that have developed in India and uh, we shall see a few of them. So if you start from the northwest. So Punjab you have the Gatka. This is the famous art form that we have there in Punjab, which is there. Similarly, so, so Shastra Vidya is, is also in, is so important. The practitioners of Punjab have practiced it so well. Unfortunately, all these art forms were banned during the British colonial rule of India is what we should explain. All the Vidya, all these Vidyas are banned because they felt it will be inimical to their rule of the land because these people are well trained Kshatriya Bhava and then they'll be able to bring out aggression against British rule. So they banned all these things. So we have some manuscripts too and they took all. Not only did they do that, they took away most of the manuscripts of training because they didn't want it to lie in India. They have, most of the manuscripts are now in the British Museum there. So that's how it happened. Now look at the other places. For example, you look at Maharashtra, which again a vibrant form of uh, the scale which is called as Mardani Kale obviously popularized a lot during the times of Chhatrapati Shivaji and others uh, during the Maratha rule it became quite popular and all the Maratha men and women they carried out this, tra this training as a self defense that's the beauty of it and it encouraged them to create a large physically strong body of people across the hinterland of the whole Maratha region. And we come to Odisha. We all hear about the Paika Akhada. The famous traditional Akhadas we have practiced there. So it's popular among the youth of the land. It was very popular among the youth of the land. Which is what the Paika revolution itself took place it was before the 1857 war. So you had these people happening all over. Now let's look at Tamil Nadu again. This here the, we have the famous idea of Silambam. Fighting with the stick. With a st strong bamboo stick. So Silambam has been a very popular uh, art form. And the Yuddha form very clearly. And you had of course protective gear. And then this was this became a Rahasya Kala because the British had banned it. Again, look at that. They banned it not only in Tamil Nadu, they banned it in Punjab, they banned it in the in Odisha, all over. So we lost a tradition because of a 200-year ban. And similarly, if you see in Tamil Nadu also, in there when you practice spirituality, you need to practice how to take in pain, how to handle self-defense. So this was, this was one of the Great areas of teaching and uh, starting from Dandal, a variety of other ways of training has taken place where you do different poses, like a frog, like a snake, all those things. So different poses, all these things have been well taught and trained in this land. So coming to Odisha, there is there are still you can see a lot of Kalari. 
So the Kalari is the, is the equivalent of a Nakadal, a gymnasium school. And Payate are the fights, the practices that go on. And this is where uh, Bodhi Dharma learned his uh, martial art. And he learns it from a Damu Gurukal. And the, this, see, all this interesting data we are today able to find in Shaolin Temple. So, about Bodhi Dharma learning this from Damu Gurukal, it's a data we get from Shaolin Temple, not from Indian records. So, that's it. So, all the modern techniques, what you call Kung Fu, all this comes, evolves from here. Kalari, Payuttu. And who set up these first Kalaris is what you have to see. 108 Kalaris were set up by Parshurama at least 6 millennia before Bodhi Dharma time. And look at the continuity that has come down through the ages in actual practice. It's a practice that has survived the onslaught of time for 6 millennia is something that must be venerated by us, really. And uh, in uh, stages of Kalari again, so when they teach you martial arts, so this aspect of this Guru Sishya, the Sishya Parampara, Guru Sishya Parampara, what they teach you are things like exercises to control the body. So may payate, payate is the exercise, may is the body. So how do you, what are the exercises that help you control the body? Then chartam, chartam means to jump. So chartangal, how, how do you do the jumps? And footwork, chavitis, the foot movements, how you should keep your foot so that you can balance your body well. And these are tips that only a guru can teach you that just keep it slightly tilted this way, that way, then you get this balance. So all of these only a guru can teach you so, physically when you are close to him. So Kala is not only a dance form. That's why martial arts also is a Kala because all the footwork, the movement, the body movement, everything comes in that. Each of it adds. Suppose when you play football or cricket, no, they don't teach you how to have the stance, how to bend forward to defend the ball, drive the ball, cut the ball like that. Equally important or even more important is here because this all all got to do with life and death. This martial arts, even more important, every nuance is important. And then Vadivu, which are the postures or the forms, Vadivu means forms. And then they go into at least eight uh, specific postures, that of an elephant, of a horse. So how do you position your body? Because these are animals, fundamentally all of these, it's so beautiful. We have learned from nature, looking at nature. We look at animals, how they pounce, how they move. And we try to take up similar stances to be able to uh, uh, behave like them, jump like them and uh, engage in that kind of a combat. See, because all animals know how to defend themselves and also how to attack. It's innate to them. And each of them have their distinct methods of doing it, distinct postures of doing it. And, and all of them, while they can also be soft, they can also be ferocious too, very ferocious. So, what we have done, our ancestors, right from Parashurama days is, they observe the animals, how they defend themselves and how they pounce on others. And they took pointers from these aspects of nature. And even a fish knows how to attack. Uh, a, a hen, okay, a rooster, a, a varaha, like a cat. Everyone they took and they took pointers from it and built on it into the system of the art of Kalari. That's the beauty of it. Look at this. And then uh, how do you fight? So it, in, in a Kalari, so when we talk about martial arts, one, it is about your body, how to first uh, control and the movements of your body, make it light. So whether you're holding weapons or fighting bare hand in uh, it is important to be able to keep your body light and be able to balance with foot, be able to jump to gain advantages. So all of that fundamental comes for whether whichever form of martial art, these kind of activities become very important. Then you need to look at the kind of weapon that you're going to use. Sometimes, yes, you may uh, uh, decide to fight barehanded itself. You have wrestling, kusti. Then you have Malyuddha, 
you also have a form in uh, Uttar Pradesh which is used uh, and today it has evolved into the style which is called boxing because this is called mukki. So uh, hitting with your wrist, mushti, mukki, they're all with wrist. And uh, today also if you go to uh, the Mysore Palace, you will find claws of uh, Shivaji, uh, tiger claws. People used to not just use mukki like this, but they could also use uh, certain uh, claws over here when they do their uh, uh, wrestling. And uh, so therefore, when you then decide to use sticks as your weapon, so kol dari, so fighting with sticks, then anka dari, so using metal weapons like daggers and swords, so pointy weapons, so anka dari, then uh, then verum kai prayogam, it's called. That means just only using your hands. Bare hands. Bare hands. Bare hands. And look at this. Apart from this, what in you is what? The 108 marma points, which can which are there in our body, which can disable or kill a person. That's why it's called marma kala. What does the word marma mean? That is not which is seen, which is secret. Marma. Okay, that which is gupta, not seen. So, this was the point. So they knew in the body where they are. And when you, especially when you do the Virumkai Prayogam, what do you do? You have your fingers available to go touch or hurt those points, which is what Bodhidharma had learned, which he took it there. Which is what is he? So they knew these points and then they took it there. And from which this Marmakala, you get two varieties of treatment in Ayurveda. One is called in China, of course, the name I am doing, English name and we will get back to the Ayurvedic name. One is called acupuncture. Other is called acupressure. That is the anglicized form of saying it. But one is acupuncture, what do we call it in, in our uh, martial art forms and traditional uh, treatment forms of Ayurveda, we call it Suchi Ayurveda, because in acupressure, you use a needle, a suchi, puncture. a puncture. So, it is called Suchi Ayurveda. And acupressure, we call it Marma Sthana Ayurveda. So, you know those sthana, those places, which is not seen, is gupt, but you know where it is. So, you know how to approach it to either maim a person, hurt a person, immobilize a person or even treat a person. So it's got both. It's got qualities to immobilize a person. It's also got qualities to treat a person. So that is what the nerve endings are doing. So that is what they, so they are identified this 108. And this was part of the training. So you, you had to be also a good Marmastana Ayurveda specialist to be able to excel in coloring. So you find that when we talk about martial art, it is not just only about fighting and it is an integrated and it's not a separate discipline as well. It is an integrated aspect of the art, Kala and also of all these sciences, the science of Ayurveda, the science of keeping yourself fit. So various other aspects also come into uh, play. Look at the way showing you some of the paintings. This is a, a great guru by name Lakshmanan. Teaching, teaching how to fight. Because we spoke about the, the different jumpings just a minute back. So you can see that. And there are different types of in the body. So he, he, you know, the, the marma prayoga and to whom will a teacher teach it? That's very important. A teacher will teach this marma sthana techniques only to a student whom he is convinced will not misuse it ever in his life, abuse it, because these are, these are really Gupta Gya and has to be used only in that perspective. So that, so only after somebody reached the mental state, was it even taught to them as to what these are. So the grades of levels of teaching, that's so the beauty of it. Here, therefore, this highlights one particular point here. It highlights the aspect that when you are teaching these kind of martial arts, even more important it is to teach good values, dharma, to the practitioner. 
So it is not sufficient that you go for an arts class and you just learn these techniques and come back home and practice and become an expert. But parallelly, there has to be an avenue where the person who is getting trained is exposed to the ideas, the philosophy of the land, the dharma of the land, the principles of good living, so that they don't misuse this particular art. That is very, very important. And that was fulfilled actually by a, a composite environment of a gurukula. So people would go. So even when you say akhadas and all, they still, they would go and live there. And so they would go and live there with the guru who would also impart these value-based uh, training about what is the dharma of the land, what is the ethos of the land, what are the principles by which one should live, when should one use this, when not to, all of this has to go, only then you become a mature person and capable of being able to put this art to use. So it goes back, this idea of color repetition goes back many centuries. You can see, so it was traditional, physical, mental and an art. So it was both bare hands as well as wielding weapons. It was a scientific method of training, just Vigyana. While it was a color, it was also a Vigyana. And it gave rise to all the so-called art forms all over the uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia and other parts of the world. And we have already seen about how Po Ti Tama, Bodhi Dharma, he took it there and he brought forth all these art forms for all of us, the world to see now. So, so look at the word, when you say the word Karate, it comes from the word Karam, hand. So that's how it has sort of developed. Across and the, uh, there is a beautiful art form in uh, uh, South India, which is called Kara Tandavam. So it is a dance and also with Karam. So where the hand and hand movements, so Karam gets more focus. The strength of the Karam is displayed here. And at the same time, it is a Tandavam. It is a Nritya as well. Well, all of you know Tandavam of Shiva, isn't it? The, the Tandava Nritya of Tiva, Shiva, that is, he's got two types. One is Ugra Tandavam. Other is Ananda Tandavam. I'm sure uh, the famous Nataraja uh, bronze icons we see, uh, what do you call as the Chola icons? I'm sure all of you are well aware of them. Uh, the famous, which, the circular round ones where, where Nataraja, the king of Natanam, Natya is there, Nataraja, and two types Ugra Tandavam, Ananda Tandavam. But whereas when you hear you're talking about the Ugra Tandavam, when you say Kara Tandavam, it is because using the hands, karam, it as, as your steps are there, balance steps, you use it to fight. So that is how it comes about, the term. Now, this is the it's a holistic form for both the mind and the body. That's why if you look at some of the Shaolin films, you see they speak so much about the mind, which was something new to the Western world 50 years ago, because so much about all this comes from here. And... It's a combat area and this is mentioned in the Sangam literature, not only in the north, but in the Tamil Sangam literature too. It goes back by about five millennia. Look at the beautiful art form that it bring about. The training, the, the grappling, the kicking, the leaping. How they have to, so they have both weapons as well as danda, the stick. Both, they use both to, to do this. And it's a harmony, mind you. What is important is, a couple of years back, one of the exponents, a lady uh, from Kerala, she was awarded the Padma Shri. So that's how it, it is. So it's so many people now learning this as an art form has become. Because now it's not used so much in direct one-on-one -on -one combat, which is was centuries ago. It's become an art form, the beauty of it. A lot of youngsters have got into learning this. Because it's all a balance of body and mind. That is what it's bringing about. A lot of youngsters. And to talk about this particular Kaleri Paitu, the way we for uh, bow and arrow, all of us speak about Arjuna of the Mahabharata as the best wielder of the arrow. That's why the sports award, today's sporting award by, by India, Independent India, is called the Arjuna Award. 
Because we say among the archers, the best archer was Arjuna. Of course, there could be other equally good archers too, like Ekalavya, Karna, and so many more people. But for certain reasons, we have eulogized uh, Arjuna and said it's Arjuna Award. Not just for archery, but for sports in general itself. Similarly, for the purpose of Kaleri Paitu, the great name equivalent to say Arjuna for archery, for this is called Tachoni Othanan, who lived in North Kerala about 500 years ago. He was a great exponent of this particular art. Unfortunately, due to some intestine uh, fights, he did not live long. He died by the age of 32. But there is even a temple there. And he is considered one of the great experts of the earth. Incidentally, about him and his skills, which are folklore, legends, in especially North Kerala. Amar Chitrakatha, about 40 years back, bought out a nice uh, illustrated uh, story book about him that you can uh, please check out sometime later. It's very well written book, I thought, about him. And there have been films made about Tacholi Othanan 50 years ago. Okay, so the, so there's a great people like that. Who then Tachyotan used it within his was late, whereas later, look at this, this great king called Parasai Raja of Kerala. He fought with these skills, these techniques against the British. He rebelled against the British rule. That's why the British banned the Kalari weapons because they felt. And then it could not be taught open because they felt that it is these people who are instigating freedom struggle movements. So what happened was then teaching this went underground literally. So there were great uh, teachers who taught, who continued the skills of training. Because otherwise it will die within a generation. The skills will die within a generation because it has to be, as she had said some time back, you can have some scriptures, some writings. <coughs> which are there, but which are all taken away back to England because they didn't want to leave them here. So it had to be taught literally hand to mouth or mouth to hand. So these teachers taught these to and kept it alive for us to know that such a great tradition exists in this land. And one of the people who effectively used it against the British hegemony was this particular great Raja of the Malabar region. And look at this. She is a Padmashri awardee. She is a grand old lady of Kalari At the age of 70, she is tra still training herself and so many more people. So, the good point is recognition is coming back for our martial arts in our own way. Our own beautiful way. That's the beauty of it. It's just coming back now. I'll just show you one more example here. Look at this. This, this is another form of but look at the emphasis on the footwork for people here. That's what it's a it is preliminary training. I'll show you one more example. It's a beautiful uh, film clip that we have got. We'll try to show you for a moment. Of uh, I'm sure all of you would have heard of. Uh, All of you have heard of in Australia, all of you have heard of the idea of boomerang. That which you throw comes back to you. Isn't it? That which you throw comes back to you. Whereas look at this here. Idea of boomerang that which you throw comes back to you, isn't it? That which you throw comes back to you. Whereas, look at this here. They'll just try and uh, get that for you. Just one minute. It's very, very beautiful to see. Just a minute.
So look at this word. When we look at this as a uh, as a fighting form. We'll see when we get it. We'll, we'll try and uh, we had it. We kept it open just to show you all. Somehow it's got lost here. Yeah. So when this has gone all over the world and look at the name it's got. It's got the Chinese martial arts today. It's called Jujutsu. And this is traceable to the Sanskrit word Yuyutsu. Yuyutsu. Where it means that those who are keen, who are who have a desire to fight, to engage in a fight, who are uh, eager to fight, to settle things and get into a mode of fighting. Yuyutsu. So this is how Jujutsu is practiced today. I mean, this is the form of art, martial art. Many of us know about it. So, wishing to fight Dharma Kshetra, Kurukshetra, Samaveta, Yudsva. So, people who were eagerly, it was a Kurukshetra, it was a Dharma Kshetra in Kurukshetra, where you found all the people waiting, ready to fight. So, a combatant. So, the, the, the Chinese term Jujutsu or the Eastern term Jujutsu clearly has the terminology itself, the roots in our Indian word, which finds mention very clearly in the first, first sloka of our Bhagavad Gita. So on this, we have made a short film, we will share it with you on uh, Yujutsu. It's a, just a, a two minute film. India and Karate Jujutsu Martial Arts India has also been a land that has offered many different kinds of contact sports. The word Karate comes from the root word Kra, meaning to do, and Karam for hands in Sanskrit. Karate is indeed a sport played with limbs, hands, mainly Karam. Karate involves using certain spots on the limbs where power can be focused to deliver impact on the opponent. The famous Japanese martial art, the name Jujutsu, has its origins in the Sanskrit word Yuyutsuhu, which means desire, mentality to fight. The word Yuyutsuhu draws its root from the Sanskrit word Yuddha for fight. In the medieval period around 760 CE, there was a great Buddhist monk by the name Bodhidharma who travelled from South India over the seas to China. His objective was to spread Buddhism along with the knowledge of meditation or dhyan which became Chan in China and Zen in Japan, giving rise to Zen Buddhism. Bodhidharma is described as having learned Kalari Payetu, an Indian parent form of martial arts. It is from this and the Yoga Mudra hand positions that Kung Fu and other martial art forms are described as having evolved when Bodhidharma stayed and taught at Shaolin. Tacholi Uttenan from Kerala being the most renowned practitioner of Kalari Payetu in Indian history. Kalari means gymnasium school. Payattu means exercise, fights. Another parent form of Indian contact sports is Kara Tandavam, a martial art form which is a dance of the limb. Kara is hands and Tandavam is the ultimate dance. Thus, Bodhidharma took this knowledge with him to China and from there it spread to Japan and Southeast Asia and developed into further variants there like Karate, Jujutsu, etc. From there it spread further world over. 
Some of these continued with just their hands, while some others included weapons or other implements as time evolved. The home of knowledge, wisdom and... So you can see from this... So, so you can see from this, this is, a, this is a short film for all of you to share with, uh, with people you want to about how in a, in a capsule of two minutes, you are trying to explain so many components of it for all of us to know. Uh, we will just show you one more bit of it. Which one? Which one? Oh. Oh. Just, just give us one more, we will show you something. See, in one of the other contact sports, as you call martial arts, is a is a is a very famous uh, sport between a bull and and the man. It's called jalli katti nowadays. I'm sure it was the news for all the wrong reasons about three four years back. That's why I want to tell you what it is. Look at the word jalli katti. Of course, it's a it's a much more anglicized name now, but the original name was salli. Salli means coins. And cut means tie. So it was the coins, precious coins, gold coins, silver, all, all of them were tied to the either, uh, to the horn of the bull. So it was important for a person not to hurt the bull, not to kill the bull as in the Spanish game of matador. But here it was very clearly to get control of the bull. By only holding its hump. The beauty of all the Indian bulls is what? The hump. If you look at this, there are various types of bulls in the world. One of them is called Bos Indicus. Bos comes from the bovine for cow, for the genre of cows. Okay. There's other called Bos Zebu, and then there's a, there's a Bos that is the Taurus, which is there in Turkey. Uh, it is there in Iraq and Turkey. That, so, what you have in the European cows are all boss taurus, where they don't have a hump. Almost all the Indian cows have a pronounced hump. That's why if you see the Nandi in any Shiva temple has a clear hump. That is the speciality of an Indian bull. So, you tamed an Indian bull by holding its hump, but not hurting it. Okay, that was the beauty of the Jalli Katti game where then once you have tamed the bull, you, you can price out the price money, the coins. That was the beauty of it. So this would need people, youth fundamentally, who were having a good body, a lot of strength, who have trained themselves in wrestling and various other such forms of uh, combat. So when you see some of these sports, you can... See that unless people have had this kind of training and exposure, they cannot attempt these kind of sports and other acts as well. So, so look at the clear hump of the, look at the beautiful hump. Look at the size of the bull, the strength of it, this Vrishabha has. It's just a, it's not an ox or a bull, it's a Vrishabha. Look at the strength and look at this. This is depicting this Jallikattu from the Harappa Manjadara times itself. See, this all people here uh, accosting the bull. This one head here, one head here. Here, look at this. People here all accosting the bull. The hump of the bull. Look at these pictures very clearly. Look at this here. This, holding it by the horns. Literally holding holding it by the... Mind you, the, our sport is not to do with matador or the what you did in the Roman circus. You killed the bull after the event and had it as a meal. No. For us, it was a divine animal of Lord Shiva, where you only 
tamed it to show your your personal virility against a very virile bull and then we were able to succeed in that process it was also an exercise to keep the virility of the animal also yes the bull as well okay, the variety of uh, paintings we have of different people fighting different martial art forms and this particular varma kala which was banned obviously they, they, the british were mortally scared of what all we could do and if you, the modern game of kabaddi which is so popular now you have got a kabaddi league now all this emanates from the same martial art form absolutely emanates from the same martial art form we have it's become a modern sport now and happily so because this is the traditional sport of india no kabaddi is getting national recognition soon it should get even like international recognition that's how it has come up and not only did they practice these sort of arts on land they practiced on water too with their boats they used to they used to balance between boats and so that was a so boats were used only for fishing or traveling it was also used for art forms for martial art forms that's the beauty of it so they used to, so look at this particular the way your malkam the beautiful sport of malkam in maharashtra in other parts of india too you had this where you had to climb the very slippery uh, pole and look at here there are coins here gold coins here tied at the top just the way they did for the bull here also they have uh, and they put oil so this became slippery in spite of it you have to climb slipping oil pouring oil on you have to climb up to go pick up the coins the way you have this in bombay okay for janmashtami you have this famous uh, festival and other parts of india too so look at this so they kept the body and mind fit through the land to different festivals too that's a beauty of it that they did and there are different ways of doing it and and for the children before they trained us they had this sort of games to train the children to get into this and the finger nimb nimbleness you got so you had a range of sport through which you could do and get people to be nimble in mind in fingers in physical body everything now it was not only here you had this in manipur too we'll show you some example and we'll show you an example from karnataka the next 10 minutes before see manipur is very very interesting land okay it has given rise to two of the it's the home the origin for two very popular sports of the world today one is polo and the other is field hockey and both of them are ball and stick game even though polo first you associated with the horse it is actually fundamentally a ball and stick game you are playing that sitting on a horse back and uh, this ball and stick game and similarly if you look at hockey again it is a ball and stick game so the word for ball and stick game is kangje in manipuri language so kangje a ball and stick gave rise to two major games one is sagol kangje which is polo it also had a local name pulu from which it comes as polo this is there in our mini book uh, manipur uh, on manipur you will see that again on the website uh, in under mini books and uh, field hockey comes from mukna kangje now the word mukna and that that actually gives rise to this field or their game used to be called mukna kangje from where they modified the rules to come up with the way we play hockey today and uh, here is where you can see what is this mukna kangje how they are playing it with their uh, stick see so the mukna kind of puris so century ago few centuries ago so this is their kind of stick so similar to the hockey stick and mukna kangje the I, the word mukna is a martial art it is a form of wrestling and this mukna kangje the rule was very uh, kind of similar to hockey but slightly variant in that you could carry the ball and you could take it but only when it is hit by the stick it becomes a goal otherwise it is not a goal so you could take the ball and you could Uh, handle it in different forms, either with your feet or hand. That is all right. But only if you hit it with the stick, it becomes a goal. On the other hand, for the opponent, 
they could tackle the person carrying the ball and prevent him from taking the ball near the goal and they would use wrestling technique so here you can see them uh, the opponents tackling them using wrestling technique so, so that is mukna look at this they are holding them by the waist band and literally lifting them up see so here. in sumo how you do it no? in sumo wrestling japan used the waist band to use this very similar to that using the waist band of the person to hold the person and then you you play the rule so look at this so we have given a variety of games the the international game polo that's played so much in usa and all of us many people wear the polo t-shirt it comes from our manipuri game called the ball was called pulu this ball was called pulu from which comes the word polo actually it was a british officer by name sherer who saw this game being played here and took it to west that's what we, we we explain that in our book how it happens and how these games are played very clearly a game from our proud northeast of bharat the land of manipur mani itself means gem the the town nagara the area of the gem the mani so these two are gems of the land that we have that we have shown you now we just show you one more uh, one or two more things so we have told you this all there in our book to read for all of you for because there's lots to say so they also talk about mukna being uh, going back and kangje kind of games going back to mahabharata times and that means that goes back to about at least 5000 odd years ago so this again you see that uh, throughout the land some form or the other of okay. keeping uh, fit hmm? and all of us will do from manipur will come down south to karnataka all of you are well aware that the vijayadashmi festival in mysuru palace is so well known popular festivals huh? so in in the mysuru dasara festival look at this famous festival is the dasara festival of mysuru where all the festivities happen outside the palace for people to see there is only one particular festival of the traditional wrestling that happens inside the palace courtyard itself where the raja yuvaraja and all of them take part in it along with the royal this is the royal wrestlers look at them this is a black and white photo era of the royal wrestlers when this is inside the palace courtyard this is inside the palace even today that even happens and you can see if you go on a uh, visit to the mysore palace they will show you this courtyard where uh, the wrestling uh, events take place during dasara look at this this is a palace happen this happening in the, inside the palace wrestling is an event this part of the dasara celebration so and uh, look at the name See they give vajra mushti so this is the one remember we i look at his hands they they hold uh, certain uh, weapons or claws with which again they can fight it's so, actually what he is holding is the antlers the, the deer the antlers horn that's what they are holding in their hand see but you can see that they are holding it in their hand the strong deer antlers horn so it's called vajra mukti kala that's what they are holding in their hand beautifully so and where did this come from before it came to the mysore palace it was in the krishnadevaraya kingdom where it was there so they, the krishnadevaraya kingdom had it so there was a practice there a great practice look at this both men and ladies to practice it look at the the hairstyle bun of the lady you can clearly see it was ladies not just the men even the ladies were experts in it look, look at the where one leg is where look at the other leg is she is lifted up you know the beautiful sculpture going back a thousand years look with the with the lady with the bun hair hairstyle How it's being done, see. And this is the dibba. It's called the Baha Naomi dibba. It's now there in uh, Hampi. This is the the great Baha Naomi dibba on which lot of royal events used to happen, including this particular Mal Yuddha. Showcasing of all these arts, art forms. skills. Of course, used to have fireworks also here. Mal Yuddha here for people to watch. The, the royalty like krishnadevaraya and his predecessors and people after him to watch from here so this was it was called the maha navami dibba dibba means platform on 
Dashara, the one day before Dashara was, was Mahanami for that. So, this was, so it's been an art form that's been practiced in India from Parsharama times. From Parsharama times. Coming all the way down, we have shown you different examples in different parts of it. We have shown you Malcolm, we have shown you this and the Akadas that have kept up the tradition for us. So, uh, uh, different forms of this tradition. All so, in this. Bengal, Bangladesh, and all, you have Lati Kela. Bihar, you have fighting again with swords. So, they are called different things. But the idea, fundamental idea is good body movements, balance, postures, footwork, fitness. And using weapons such as sticks or uh, certain uh, small uh, weaponry handheld weaponry or swords and slight differences in movements or uh, techniques and footwork and it gets a different name but underlying you will see a lot of commonality similarity and the ethos that you have to keep your body fit in order to be able to also protect your civilization and society at any time. So this is uh, fundamentally you can see and, and interestingly see here there is a divinity itself in Maharashtra they have uh, a form of Shiva who is called Khandoba and uh, you know you will have the sword fighting in Bihar it's called Pari Khanda. Khanda, Khanda means sword, Khadga. You have a work on Khadga Lakshana. So look at so many things that have to come together for a martial art with a sword to really flourish. While on one side you need a lot of knowledge about Ayurveda and all of things about keeping fit, then about the art form, footwork, dance, grace, balance. You also need metallurgy to be able to manufacture very good swords. So you have about the khadga, the sword that is needed for this art form. You will find that in another text called Khadga Lakshana. Uh, which has been written on how to ma uh, manufacture, how to make these kind of very good sword. What is the lakshana of a good sword? So all of this. So today, if we have to bring back this art form. So so for all this, there is an article written called uh, Need the Color. The article is available in our blog and uh, the mini books and films also available in our website for you to go and take it and use it the way you deem fit for these sessions. And uh, we have to now, as focusing on IKS, start bringing all this knowledge from various disciplines. Because now today, sport has become a separate discipline itself. So we have to now pick it up, pick up all the related information from various aspects and then make a holistic knowledge base, which teaches the martial art, which teaches about the uh, uh, excellence that is needed in other disciplines as well to help these martial arts flourish and at the same time how to also impart the necessary values to the people who are getting trained in martial arts because now they're going to really have raw power in their hands and raw power can be dangerous unless you know how to control it. So more than teaching martial arts you can teach martial arts but equally important it is to teach the soft art of value spirituality because without your spiritual practices your martial art will not be that color that it is meant to be it will just be a pure just a sheer form of violence if it has to be a color if it has to be an act with a purpose with an objective then you need that spiritual uh, tenor to it you also need to need it to be bound by dharma and the values of dharma which are equally important in imparting this kind of uh, training. So, any questions if you have, we are happy to take at this point. Thank you, Dr. Hari and Dr. Hema Hari. Your knowledge Thank and you. sessions are so simple and so enchanting. We have been hearing you for so many years. Wonderful. I think we can take a couple of questions. It's already 10.30, but we can take a couple of questions. Is that okay with everybody? Thank you. Five, seven minutes. Um, thank you. My name is Giridhar. I am from Karnataka. Yes. Uh, so, huh? recent, Karnataka. 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 Yes. Recently, we uh, heard about the national games on Malakamba going on in Gujarat. Um, thanks to all of your efforts, we very happy to see such things happening. 
and i just want to know is there any links for the living kalari schools in kerala and uh, overall how do you see the future of these martial arts in india thank you thank you sir uh, for a very pertinent question yes we are glad that uh, uh, now it's not getting part of the national sport and in, in, it's not anymore called only rural sport earlier you had something called rural sports and a uh, modern sport no, it's all getting coming together today and equal importance is being given for this and yes there are very many centers because when lord parshurama started 108 centers unfortunately due to the travails of time some of the centers have become very small now with the new resurgence over the last uh, in new india many of the centers are now drink, are finding oxygen to come back and perform once again which is what one of the short in arm was recognizing one of the lady practitioners for which she was even awarded the padma shri in, in color which we showed you so like that many more people are getting recognized and we have to not see kalari as you asked a minute back in the question should not be seen only as a separate art form it has to be co joined with ayurveda today ayurveda is seeing pun punarjeevan happening as you said about marmastan ayurveda everything no so uh, the whole thing has to intertwine and come up because you cannot do kalari without ayurveda or you cannot do yujutsu without that so it is all intertwined so that is what is to come as a holistic perspective and take it a national and one area where it can happen is the indian army the national defense academy is now looking at opening up and taking more and more of this so since we have two special speakers from the services this uh, afternoon we can again bring it up with them so it has to be multi pronged attack yes it's happening we there's a window is open some fresh air is coming but we need to open lot more windows to get lot more fresh air and a good intertwining of the two because the traditional art forms of india have enormous value and as dr hema said it must not be looked at only as physical combat it is also got to do the mental Upbringing, as I said, no earlier, the gurus used to teach Marmastana Kala only when they, they felt the students were fit enough to learn it. Like that, there are levels and layers to it. That is a bit, and the intertwining is absolutely important between the stula and the sukshma, the physical and the subtle. That is what is important, and this is what we have to get across also. Otherwise, the Western art form is only gross, physical. Stula, the sukshma is not so much there, whereas we have a good mix of both, a, a happy, cogent mix of both. That is what we have to look for and bring forth from our Indian perspective, our Eastern perspective, our Dharmic perspective. Yes, sir. Any more questions, please? Good morning, sir. Good morning, madam. I want to know. I want two questions, madam. First, how Bodhi yes. Dharma was died? First question. How Bodhi Dharma was died. Second one, please explain about the Kati Shamu, one of the martial arts in Andhra Pradesh. Kati Shamu, yes, yeah. right. Yes, Kati Shamu. Uh, how Bodhi Dharma died? See, uh, Bodhi Dharma obviously he passed away in China. So his last days were uh, probably see this. See the multiple stories to it. So whatever we hear is only from a Chinese version, not from our version, not from Indian version. one of the versions is that he probably wanted to at the end of his life return back to his native kingdom he wanted to come back probably people did not want him to leave they wanted his body so probably one view is one story is that again some folk tale folk tale one this is probably they poisoned him so that his body will remain in china his skills will remain in china with them that could be one thing or probably to old it was He actually went when he was quite old. When he went from here itself, he was quite old. He was well past the sixties, probably his early seventies when he went. So he was not a youngster in his twenties, thirties going. Because he was a prince, lived here, travelled all over South India. Then he went to Nalanda, practiced, then he came back, travelled all over the land. It's only finally at the much later stage of his life that he set sail from Mamallapuram all the way. And he didn't go straight to Chennai. He went from here to Sri Lanka, spent some time in Sri Lanka. Then he went to Vietnam. Then he went to uh, Southeast China. Then he went to Interior China. So he did take a few years to travel. And one of his brothers also joined him a couple of years later. So there's a mix. All that we explained in the book, uh, in the mini book called Bodhi Dharma. It's there for free read. 
in our website. So, uh, how the end is obviously you only hear the local story, which also multiple uh, detailing, but suffice to say that he spent his last days in China and he is not only while he was born in the Pallava kingdom, was a Pallava prince, he has become an international figure, a figure who gave rise to a whole series of martial arts for the whole of eastern part of the world, which has also taken the West by storm. Because it was not only physical, but it was also mental and spiritual. He mixed, it was intertwined of the two. That's the beauty of it. That is what we need to take the larger lesson over after 1,500 years of his time. Yeah. And uh, coming to uh, Kati Samu and Kara Samu and all. So fundamentally, like I said at one point in time, all the martial arts, the base seems to be very common. It's about footwork. It's about learning the art of uh, uh, giving that bounce to your body, being able to jump. Uh, uh, so all, the body movement, the focus on your body, which is why we spent a little time in that Kerala where they taught about mei payattu. They call by different names, but that the fundamental thing is learn to control your body, control your limbs, give a sense of lightness to your body. Once you learn that, then it is a matter of uh, handling different kinds of weapons. And these fundamentally are stick and then those kind of uh, horns or claws and nails or daggers and swords. So the shape of the sword can change. It can be a two-edged, it can be a curved form of sword. So that may change or it, the stick, the thickness of the stick, the length of the stick, these can change. But and maybe the rules of the when it is uh, fought as a game, as a duel, the rules may change uh, here and there. But largely you can club it as either with a stick, which is karasamu and then kati samu with a sword. Or whether you call it a latikela or a karasamu or a silambam, uh, they're all uh, similar uh, thing which are all grounded in the basic form of martial art, uh, niyuddha kala of Bharat, which is also further grounded in the dharma yuddha, the uh, idea of dharma yuddha, the idea of dharma, and all of that. So the grounding is common. And it's just the expressions are slightly different. The names are slightly different. Based on the lands, based on the topography, based on the hydrology, based on the climate, you have to create variants. That's the beauty of the land. That's the diversity of the land. I said the base is the same. The grounding is the same. The variants have to be there. That's the beauty of it. And you appreciate the beauty of the diversity because it's all topography based. It's all hydrology based, climate based. The variants came about and they naturally grew. They were organic in the grew from the land, from that Prithvi. That is the beauty of it. Each of them is to be equally respected for the beauty they bring in. See, it also depends on the physical form of the person who is going to be performing that particular art form as well. So, different regions, people's physique is slightly different, and certain movements are possible, not possible. So accordingly, they tailor and they come up with uh, a set of movements which are, which become kind of a local art form. Tradition. She used the word, one word, see, when you say tandem dance, what is the beauty of dance? I'm sure you have all seen many, many dance performances. How do you distinguish a good dancer? The, the, there's a word in English, L-I-T-H, light, somebody who, not light, light, who can move easily from one place to another. That distinguishes a good quality dancer. Similarly, in any of these martial forms, how good your footwork is to move. In cricket, batsmen, what is important? The footwork in batting. In football, what is important? The footwork to move to the right place. In hockey, everything. So look at the, the way you move your body, how light you keep yourself body to move quickly, artistically and beautifully. That's what matters. And that all comes not from the physical body, alone, but that comes from the mind. How you train your mind, tune your mind to be calm. Only then it will come. The best of body cannot produce it sufficiently enough as which is in synchronization with the mind. That's the beauty of our dharmic systems. Thank you, Any Dr. Hari. We will. Huh, thank you so much for your detailed answers.
I'm sure there are more questions, but I will share your email ID at the end of the FDP so that they can interact with you and take their interests forward. We have a break time before we start the next session. These are long days. FDP ends almost at 5.30, sometimes even 7. Yes. So the break is also very important. <laughs> Thank you so it's much. Thank, Thank you so much Wonderful. once again. We wish you all the best for the remaining <laughs> sessions. Thank you all. We were originally Namaste. scheduled Namaste. to have both Dr. Hari and Himahari here at IIT. But on the same day, they have a program with the governor. It was clashing and they really tried to make yes. their way. But somehow this was the only way they could uh, connect with us. Thank you, you so much. to be there. Yes. Thank yes. You. Certainly, Thank we'll you. do a lot of things with the Center of Excellence. Yes. Dr. Mahesh, my yes, colleague sir. is also there. Just standing. Okay. Yeah. From the Center of Thank Excellence you. from Indian Knowledge University. Systems. He's from astronomy. That's his background. Okay. Wonderful. Nice to have met him. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Have a good day. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Next, Schools and Thinkers by Dr. D.K. Hari and Dr. Hima Hari. And now we will be seeing the cogent statement of knowledge and ideas and applications and way forward in Neo Dhakala that is martial arts. We are very, very happy to have with us Dr. S. Mahesh from Agastyam Kalairi Patu. And he is the son of the legendary Kalairi master and Siddha expert, Sri R. Sanal Kumar Gurukal. Dr. Mahesh Gurukal was initiated into Kalairi Patu at a very young age and is a fifth generation martial artist. He is a multifaceted personality who has done his master's in journalism and his doctoral thesis on the topic, Influence of Kalari Patu in Curing Systems. He is an expert in Thekkan Sampradayam of Kalari Patu, Siddha Medicine, Vastu Shastra and Mystical Tantric Practices. He is the author of books on Kalari Patu, Vastu and Yoga. He also has a successful career in the media after having received several state awards for his short movies and documentaries. As of now, he is involved in the epic film Kaliyan as the director and writer with Malayalam superstar Prithviraj. His brainchild, Agastyam, to raise one's consciousness to a higher level through the rigors of Kalari Patu, is aiding many students to have a great psychophysical transformation in life. So let's welcome Dr. S. Mahesh with a big round of applause on closing statement of knowledge and ideas and applications and way forward in martial arts. And I was just requesting him to teach us some movements so that we can do some practice, some movements in this session. Welcome, Dr. Mahesh. So Namaskaram, Namaskaram on. I think uh, today morning, that was, that was a wonderful session you had attended. Uh, Dr. D.K. Hari and Hema Hari had explained a lot about Kalari, about the martial arts and all, in general, I think. But uh, specifically, I am from the South. I am learning, evolving and teaching Kalari Pai to Southern style, the Southern style of Kalari Pai. So, I would like to focus a little more on the South knowledges, the, the wisdom of the 18 Siddhas, uh, the Kalari practice and all that we are doing is little bit like it's a, it's a practical style that is Southern style, which has a very, very what do you call it, wonderful treasure of knowledge embedded inside that and not yet explored. So I will start my presentation uh, with a similar part. So I'll go for the, I think you can see this, right? So I'll start with the similar part. It says, Chirappaga Aran Umaik Sonna Vartai Sendil Vadi Velavarim Unik Sonna Tarani Tanil Manuor Hal Pirai Padarke 
സകല നൂലും വെളിവാക പാടലുറ്റ See, these are the lines from Marma Nidana. Marma Nidana is a text composed by Sage Agastya. So, as you all know, it is believed that all knowledge of Bharat originated from Lord Shiva. The Padal says, Shiva conveyed this knowledge to his wife Umayal. So for the first teacher is Shiva and the first student is a woman that is Umayal and who turned in turn taught to her son Subramanya. From Velen or Murugan, Agastya got Kalari training. For mankind on earth to give them courage and ward of diseases, I teach it. The text is Marma Nidanam 500 with 500 verses by Agastya. So he starts this pardon like this. You should understand why Vedas and Upanishads compared knowledge in the north, there were equivalent compositions at the southern end of India, composed from the highest of the thinking about living, life, physical transformation, mental transformation and uh, spiritual relapse. There was a rich lineage of Agastya with uh, his incredible contributions and the 18 Siddhas who followed him through the centuries in the south. The word Siddhar indicates those who have gained certain Siddhis, certain superhuman achievements. Siddhis. They are said that they are accomplished one. So they they are not pseudo scientists, scientists or uh, mystical thought. Basically, they are not like that. They left their marks as doctors. They tried their level best in scientific research. They were scientists. They were yogis. They were alchemists, and they were pressure point or Burma experts. But I don't know, our nation has not been introduced to them properly. They have not received due recognition. Or it is better to say that we have not been provided the opportunity to become familiar with their incredible body of work. So, at midst of a culture steeped in myths and legends, these Siddhas got a scientific worldview that was closer to life. They taught us to know ourselves. During the epochs of invasions and resistance, they taught the people a science of defense, a science of fighting. We can proudly say it has clarified the mother of all martial arts. So Kalaripite educates us about the mind and the body and their immense potential. It's a martial art from that leads down a strong foundation for a good health, good life. So I'll say one more battle. Bodhiya Vedan Nidanapadi so, this model says there are 72,000 nadis functioning in the human body. The body is only 8 charms. So, you can, you can measure your body in this length, this chart, from here to here. So, uh, The Siddha taught us through songs. They conveyed the discoveries musically, set for remembering. I'll uh, introduce another Siddha Padal also. It says, Andathil Ullade Pindam, Pindathil Ullade Andam, which means the divine light that fills this 
universe is also within you. Just as we cannot see nothingness or vacuum, we are unable to sense the Brahman within us. So it's because of our ignorance, these lines uh, should be studied very well because we can explain these two lines. In, maybe we can take a day long session in these two lines. These two lines are by Udham by Siddha, one of the Siddha, uh, one of the eighty, one of the prominent Siddhas in these eighteen Siddhas. The depth of the lyrics are as impressive as beauty of their compositions. Siddha tradition is the continuous exploration of the separation and the unity of Parabrahman and the body. They usually say, Andam Tan Pindam. And uh, we can move to little more light on Siddha tradition. The Siddha traditions are also known as Shiva Sampradayas or knowledge system of Shiva or the Supreme Consciousness. Shiva Sampradayam became Siddha Sampradayam after Agastya's migration to South India. And Agastya, as you know, is a Vedic saint as well as a Siddha saint and he had written 96 sacred text from this foundation about Marmas, about uh, their life, about yoga, about Jodisha, lot of things he had written. So Siddha system of medicine is said to be have in existence in South India, especially in Tamil Nadu, from the last many centuries, even from the time of famous Tamil Sangha, the first, this is the oldest Indian system of treatment, we can say, before uh, Tamil Sangam literatures, Tamil Sangam period, this system is remained here. I think uh, coming January 9th is Agastya Jayanti and uh, uh, government is also planning to celebrate uh, uh, the Siddha day. So, through these songs and the Kalari steps and moves, they attempted to create enlightened warriors. The warriors with strong mind and body. Or we can say a fearless human. So here we come to give a little light on uh, evolution of martial arts. We are always saying Kalari Pai is the mother of martial arts. So we can't think that Kalari, from Kalari all martial arts learned or Kalari was the foremost one, we can't say like that. Because if you are observing the modern martial arts, just like the Chinese martial arts or any other martial arts in the world, we have, we can see the strong inspiration, strong inspiration of Kalari Pai or the southern styles of martial arts. It is very much evident, it is very prominent and it is uh, accepted anyway. So I am just saying about the evolution of martial arts. The word martial arts came from the Greek idea, the art of Mars. We know that martial arts and their evolution took place over thousands of years. Martial arts originated along with mankind. First cultural formations. In ancient India, China and Greece, martial arts were created as a form of resistance and tool for survival. As you might know, we measure cultures or civilizations through the presence of their tools and weapons. So it is the discovery of tools and weapons that help us recognize and study cultures. From stone frames and arrowheads, they moved to iron and other metals. As the tools changed, culture changed. Civilizational history is a history of conflict, of war, 
along with wars the arts related to war developed the cave paintings and other pictographs from ancient cultures around the world show that military training or martial art training were an integral part of society naturally such training must have existed before they were committed to paintings by artists of even cave dwellings uh, consider the paleolithic age spears were prominent weapon during the the uh, lower paleolithic age dhanush or bow and arrow and associated dhanu vidya become significant in the upper paleolithic age there we can come to india and we can just observe what is dhanu veda as far as bharata is concerned historians state that dhanu veda developed alongside ajur veda between uh 7700 uh, 1100 bc it is the veda of dhanus or bow it is also an upaveda of ajur veda this veda was compiled by either bhrigu or vishwamitra or bharadwaja or sadashiva it has been attributed to many sages so the dhanu veda contains knowledge about mushti yuddha or bare hands or fist fighting and the word dhanur veda is about bow and arrow then about uh, chariot based warfare that is ratha chalana then ashva chalana was there or horse back fighting was there the text also discuss army formation or uh, vyuhas it is a very elaborate and incredible compilation that brings together diverse techniques so we can see inside the dhanur veda there is there is a shloka that, that says shakti adi pani muktam sya indra muktam sharadikam mukta muktam cha ishti adi damuktam churigabhikam here it means that shakti shakti adi pani muktam sya the weapon which can release from the hand is hands hand is something like shakti shakti uh, come come under the pani muktam category or weapons that leave the hand towards the enemy spears are thrown tools or yendra propelled weapon that is yendra mukta like the arrow or shara that is sent from the bow here the arrow gathers more strength as it is launched from tool rather than the arm so there there, there is a mukta mukta category weapons like ishti which is released from the hand but can be recovered we can think about the boomerangs actually we have uh, boomerangs we call it valari valari the next we can throw and it will come back so amukta weapon do not leave the hand so this category we can see pani mukta yendra mukta 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 and amukta amukta weapons they do not leave the hand like sword dagger churiga in kalari thus expert says that kalari pai to weapons belongs to amukta category of dhanurveda but uh, these studies are going but we when we check uh, the sankha period if you examine the sankha era uh, literatures like uh, akampadal uh, purambadal manimekala kundalageshi akananur puranamur then tirumurugachupadai we can see the terms kalam kalari kallibogina kalari etc evidently in different different spaces that means the word kalari was used in the foremost sankha period kalari pai to flourished as well as established before the sangam period the first sangam period or adi sangam era is attributed to agastya as its foremost sage in the sangam literature and you, you know that uh, the tamil language it, it came from agastya itself he had 
made that grammar text Agathiyam, which is the base of Tamil literature and language. So in the Sangam literature, we can find several warriors who underwent systematic martial art training. Just like we can see in Dhaturveda. Such military seems to have already been struck in the society. We can see target practices for archery. We can see horseback fighting. We can see elephant back fighting, etc. were separately talk in regular manner. So we also know about the variety of swords and spears, shields and types of bows and arrows are all mentioned in different points in the Sangam classics. Sangam era is also known as Veera Yuga. Bravery and courage in battle was most prized. It was an era when mothers used to be happy if their sons died with a wound in the chest. They prayed for such a violent death for their sons. I am make, making a movie with the same subject, which dates, dates back to 17th century. It's a 17th century movie, but the basic theme and idea and inspiration comes from this area. So they prayed for such a violent death for their sons. After such battle glory, these warriors would be immortalized with hero storms, which went on to become worshipped as God. You can Google hero storms and you can find different kinds of hero storms all over the world. Especially, uh, we can see it prominently in the southern part of India. So, we can say that such a martial art culture become firmly rooted in South India. So, then we come to Kalari. The picture that I am showing is my students performing in a uh, stage performance. So, we have more girls than boys in the Kalari now. That's a happy thing. So, Kalari Paitu in Kerala, uh, it is, you can see equivalent spaces uh, in uh, Antra as Giridis. We can see Silambam Varmakali in Tamil Nadu. And even a similar art form we can see in uh, uh, Sri Lanka, that is Angampuru. Angampura, we can see Angampura. So, in the morning session, actually, uh, Parashurama is well introduced. More than historical records, we have myths and legends and oral tradition in this area. Thus, Parashurama is also considered as the Paramaguru of Kalari Pite. Texts like, like uh, Kerala Ulpati, the history of Kerala, state that Parashurama bought the land of Kerala out of the ocean and established 108 Kalaris. So, more than historical fact, facts, all Indian art forms have legends and myths in the back. So, same like that in Kerala Alpati, we see that Parashurama bought the land of Kerala out from the ocean and he established 108 Kalaris. He also said that uh, uh, he had given charge to 21 Kalari Gurukals uh, to propagate and uh, maintain these Kalaris. So for southern style of Kalari or we can say Tekkan Kalari Pai too, Agastya is considered to be the Paramaguru. So but we have with us many texts attributed to Agastya himself. Whereas Parashurama's story doesn't provide further, further infrastructural or uh, illuminating text attributing to him. We have several dozens of texts from Agastya and the 18 Siddhas about Kalari practice, pressure point techniques or marma, marmas, Kalari based healing system and many of them are still practiced. And we should understand that uh, 
we have diverse styles also. I am representing the third style. So mostly in the morning session, they talked about the northern style of color equality. So I am, I, I, so I think I will talk mostly about the southern. But we have different, different types of color equality too. In, you can see in south. The single word color equality is used to refer to the martial art form of Ke form in Kerala. We have diverse styles. That is uh, the northern style. Parashrama is the Paramaguru for the northern style and Agastya, Agastya for the southern style. The northern style or Vadakkan or uh, Vatten Tiripu style is flourishing in Malabar or North Kerala with its highly structured and disciplined system of training. At the same time, the southern style puts more emphasis on marma and pressure points. There is another style called the Madhya Kerala or Central style. There is also Kalam Chavut Sampradayam is there, Bali Sampradayam is there. Uh, as the name says, Bali Sampradayam focuses on drawing strength from the enemy itself. Pressure point based styles is called uh, Burma Kale. Here the damage is done by focusing on pressure points of the enemy and the revival process is also there. Then Silambatam is also part of Southern Kalari style. And uh, in Sangam literature, especially in Silapadi Garam and other works show that Silambam has been practiced since at least the 4th century BC. The term Silambu referred to a particular type of bamboo. So Silambam was named after its primary weapon, the bamboo staff. So Southern Kalari style is formed from the essence of all these various styles. So even today, the teachings is done with different elements from the diverse forms. And Kalari is the only martial art form in the world which has a healing or treatment system. Another important aspect is that Kalari Paitu is the only martial art form in the world which has a healing system that I already mentioned. Kalaripaitu is more than self-defense. It is said, Todade, Todade, Total, Vidade. That means we must never touch our enemy unless they make the first move on us. Our Gurukas strongly and repeatedly instruct that we must try to avoid any attack on us at least three times before considering to fight back using our Vidya or Kalari Paitu. So we must not touch our enemy as much as possible and if we are forced to defend and counter attack then we must ensure that they are fully subdued. That is the saying that Todade Todade don't touch, touch defeat. So it is a beautiful martial art which alerts a student to love your enemy until we have no other way to save our lives. The healing system thus forms a protection system. The Gurukul is responsible for the health and well-being of the society around him. So let us examine the word Kalari Paitu. I think it is already mentioned. Kalari means school and Paitu means uh, fighting skill. So it is the school that teaches Paitu or fighting skill. I started practicing at the age of five at home because my father was a Gurukal. So I have been practicing for more than three and a half decades now. Uh, because it, it, uh, it, it was the core education system in Kerala. So I started practicing in childhood because Kalari was the way of life and vital education in our, our family. Now I recognize it as absolutely essential to develop a balanced body, mind complex and harmony in life. It is the main reason that at Agastyam, that is my Kalari, we innovated Maludal practice, which is a Kalari based fitness routine that people anywhere in the world at any age can undergo. 
we i think we had uh, given training to iit kharagpur for uh, three months i think for 100 and 100 students right 100 students so participants of the programs are uh, uh, getting tremendous benefits, not just in improved flexibility and boosted immunity, but uh, perhaps more uh, um, one second. I By saying that Kaladi was the core education system and uh, it is practiced. So, uh, in Kerala, Kaladi Paidu was the core education system. If you refer to the ancient Buddhist text, we can see Kerala's, uh, Kerala region was considered the land of very healthy and strong people. Man and woman tremendously benefited from culinary training that started at a young age for all in those times. Today, the system is all more relevant as life has become faster and more stressful. Culinary practice has been helping me and all our trainers and trainees maintain their health, physical and uh, emotional, mental strength. Kalari provides you with awareness, alertness, mindfulness, along with quicker reflexes, which help us to free from stress or free living and rejuvenation. So I am, I was talking about Naludan. Apart from that, we are uh, continuously, we are uh, uh, doing Shakti program, which has helped the women being uh, more confident with self-defense techniques. We have another program called uh, Prana, which helps senior citizens enjoy better breathing, vital capacity and energy throughout the day. We offer a mindfulness meditation through Akam program, which is an easy but extremely effective routine that even the busiest personals or professionals can practice in daily life. So, Kalaripaita is the strength and foundation of Kerala society. There have been several histori historical studies about Kalaripaita, uh, growth in uh, uh, South India. There, there is a prominent historian, his name is Sridhara Menon. He states that, Kalari Paitu is the strength and foundation of Kerala society. As you know, history all, always travels with the warriors, kings and the leader. And most of the warriors come from Kalaris. It was the strength and beauty of Kalari. There was never any discrimination based on sex, religion, caste or creed in Kalari Paitu training. All boys and girls were administrated this basic form of education. So thus a society of warriors, leaders was created from the Kalaris, immortalized by their courage. 
uh, there is a Portuguese traveler, his name is Duraid Barbosa, who came to Kerala in the early 16th century, wrote that kit, kit starts calorie training to make their bodies flexible from the age of seven. The practice begins early in the morning. They, they practice twice a day. They seem to get highly flexible. Then the weapon training are imparted. Archery sticks and daggers are used. The practice continues till death of a warrior. He discuss the different types of calories uh, belonging to the Nayas, the Tiyas, the Muslims, the Christians and the Dalits. He talk about Tiyas wearing gold ornaments as well as having the Urumi, that is the flexible sword, around their waist like a belt. Both men and women used to do this. He mentions that they can take it off with lightning speed in case of any attack. So this was his uh, uh, Durait Barbosa's expressions when he came to Kerala. So I think this condition is back in. So this is the calorie that we train our students. This is our calorie space. We have two spaces there uh, in uh, Trivandrum. Uh, so now it turns to the training part. The calorie system requires basically 12 years of training to create an excellent warrior. But the efficiency and the dedication of the warrior or the student is much important. You can even learn from five to six years. Maybe if you are dedicating much, you can, you can learn the basic ideas within five to eight years. So, calorie system requires 12 years of training, as scripture says, to create an excellent warrior. The learning begins with the mayoricum or preparation of the body. I am uh, pointing about the southern style of practice that uh, northern style of practice is already uh, explained in another session. So, mayoricum, you start with mayoricum or preparation of the body. It gets the body to become flexible and agile, to turn and twist as required. At our calorie, we incorporate breathing also into such flexibility training. This forms the foundation. Then we move to kaladupul or leg exercises to bring the strength and flexibility of the legs. After that, we begin the chuvadu or basic moves. These are meant to defend against attack from four sides. They are, uh, there are Ucha uh, uh, then uh, we have Kuta Chuvadigal. We train basically 15 Ucha and uh, then 15 Kuta Chuvadigal or combination steps uh, for the base train. Then comes to Kaipur or bare hand attacks. It is about defending and locking the attacks that focus on arms and legs. Then we learn Utkal, Utkal means locks and Piruvugal, unlocking, which is about uh, the different ways of locking the enemy and how we can escape if such locks are using against us. There are many interesting techniques in Kaipur. After bare hands, we move to Puruvadi, that is a short staff practice. Subsequently, long bow staff training is imparted. The long stick is perhaps the oldest weapon man starts using. All our initial defenses involved sticks and stones, as you know. So we learn fight with the bow, then swimming, swinging of the bow staff. Then we enter to the metal weapons. 
we, we use katharas, that is dagas, then we come to axe, we come to kantagodali, it's a different kind of axe, then, uh, then we move to sword and shield. The sword and shield and we, we have a flexible sword and it's a unique weapon which is used in Kalari, that is Urumi. Then we move to uh, spear and shield, that we call it as Marabadi Chakundam. We have Kattim Talai, that we use clothes as weapons. After weapon training, we move into Marma, Marma Shastras or Marma Points. It's a very unique learning process and it's a time taking process actually. This is a learning about the human body, the nadis and the pressure points. It's about the 108 pressure points in the human body, how they can be attacked and uh, how we can escape, how we can revive people who might have collapsed because of heat or block to their pressure points. This reviving process we call it as adangals. Then the trainee also start marma chigilsa or pressure point healing. So this is a complete system of, of learning and the, it's a complete system of understanding the body, its weakness and strength and curing ailments. The warrior training is complete only with the healer training. So Kalaripayit especially, the southern style of martial art is respected as the mother of all martial arts. That the presentation already detailed it very beautifully about Bodhi Dharma's travel to China because he was a uh, prince of Pallava. He uh, was he was he had been attacked by his own brothers. So he went to the forest, the woods. He find Pratima, a, a Buddhist nun, as his guru. Then he started pre, uh, started learning Buddhism. Then he traveled after his fifties to China. He went to Northern Sioux. He met the king. Then he went to Southern Sioux. He meditated for nine long years. It's a famous wall gazing meditation he did, and he had. Uh, written two texts relating this uh, martial art and body learning about these things. They are called the uh, Yi Jing Jing. One is Yi Jing Jing and Xin Zai Jing. Two Gantas he wrote. But uh, what happened is uh, um, the Bodhi Dharma picture. We actually uh, presented Bodhi Dharma's life in uh, this martial art mail, uh, no, uh, this IIT Mela in Delhi. Uh, he presented. So he was there. Uh, from this I Jing Jing, actually, his inside Jing is lost. I Jing Jing, actually, uh, the Buddhist uh, leader, his name was uh, Pratima. He came to India, he translated, and he went back. And from that, uh, Kempo, Kempo Karate, Karate, Jiu Jitsu, even in uh, uh, Silat, Kali, like the all martial arts got inspired from Bodhidharma's teachings. So that's why we are calling. We can, we can, evidently, we can see the animal posters, the moves, the stands, the uh, swords, the, the weapons that we are using in all these martial arts. So that's why we actually the Kalari inspired all modern martial arts very well. That's why we are saying Kalari Pai is the mother of all martial arts. So in our Kalari, we are teaching a different thing also. We are basically we are teaching how to learn Kalari. Uh, we have actually a uh, lot of uh, students uh, practicing, performing. They are uh, participating in different competitions actually. Now state level, uh, jilla, district level, level competitions are there, state level competitions are there, national level competitions are there and, and last time we participated the Kelo India uh, games also and we backed three medals for Kerala. This time also we went to national uh, championship and we went, we got some medals. Last time 
in Trivandrum District Championship, we, we bagged around 64 medals. Agastyam bagged around 64 medals. So, it's it's an academic learning process is going. So, that we call it a Nityam practice. We are, uh, we are uh, teaching them the Nityam practice. So, now it is a, it is Trinity College of Engineering, it's, the, it's an IK center for Kalari Pai and Siddha tradition and being operated by Agastyam Kalari. So, uh, what I am trying to say is about the wellness part of Kalari Pai. So, for the majority of people in the world, life has become a meaningless, mad rush of different things. As you know, minds are caught up in external things, desires, temptations and goals. There is a short time focus which prevents us from taking the long view examining the purpose of our lives as a whole. Society is involved in a shallowness or superficially crisis time. So we, through our programs like Nalludal, is proposing Kalaripai to as a lifestyle method to add depth and value to life. So Nalludal allows people of any ages to, to start. Along with the practice, it is also creating awareness. It's a method of understanding humanity more to realize the possibility and potential that has come to use in form of uh, human life. So we have tried to provide such an opportunity. So people are uh, under the common misunderstanding that life is a battle of them against the whole universe on the other side. It leads to isolated and depressing streams of thinking. So we live in a time where our state of health is highly quantified. It is no longer about whether we feel healthy. It is about whether certain number are being achieved in the lab results or weighing machines. So our awareness is dependent on these numbers and then overuse of medicines to achieve that Objects. So we seek we seek tablets to solve all the ailments and theming ailments. We have uh, tied wellness to these numbers. We are not paying attention to the mind body connection. One of the biggest problems of the modern world is ADR. Maybe you had heard about ADR or adverse drug reaction. It has become a major cause of death through Issues like, uh, it's a major cause of death nowadays. You can see the issues like non-alcoholic -al liver cirrhosis and uh, different, different um, diseases comes with this ADR. Most of the chemicals that we put in the body are unnecessary for the body. Body knows that it is not necessary for my body. So it set, set off a chain reaction in the body. The reaction from the body itself become a new disorder in our times. If we pay attention to the 18 Siddhas or Ayurveda, they state that our health is not contained in the readout of such lab result numbers. As we active and energized when we wake up, if you are, if you are active and energized when we wake up, we can if you are able to take on tasks without feeling lazy, is there joy in your minds? And if you are feeling light, then you are healthy. These are the pointers of good health according to Ayurveda. And always Siddha says, Unave marindu, marinde unavu. That means whatever you eat is the medicine. The medicine is whatever you eat. So, eating habits is also a very important thing. So, the mind is the main thing. The mind is the major part. And always in sessions like this and seminars, I usually ask people, what is the basic necessity of life? So, people uh, will be like saying, uh,
always say they always say food and shelter nobody says the basic necessity of life is free that is the issue so and people doesn't know where is the mind some people will say here i have the mind some people are say that uh, mind is here 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 they are confused actually we have a body mind complex that means our mind is deployed all over your body you can find lot of researches lot of papers on uh, this factor so we consider calorie pi 2 uh, as an effective training for the mind than the body so we create fearless generation who have enormous confidence resilience that build a strong foundation in life there is a small incident when we performed in the ikas mela in delhi in the end of uh, july this year we had put up a calorie show on the life of poor dhirma as i already mentioned during the sword and shield performance by two of our young girls her name is raga and one, one, one was gobika raga's ear was cut so gobika and raga are both national champions and they are they are 14 years and 16 year old girls raga actually continued to perform after the final cut and call after that after one hour of time we took her to aims to get two stitches when people at the mela came to know about this they wondered how a teenage girl had that kind of confidence and capacity to continue performing even after such injury actually such acts of resilience and commitment are regular occurrences with our kalari we know that kalari training instills a high level of resilience and confidence among our students in 2020 dr rian moore of charles stewart university australia he published a study called well being warriors he had conducted a randomized study of the effect of martial art training on school students and found significant improvement in the resilience part so at the ik center of kalari pai 2 at trinity college of engineering with agastyam kalari we are embarking on a similar study with kalari pai 2 we are supported by the super team of psychologist from the national institute of speech and hearing currently the proposal is with the ethics committee and we hope to start the study by january in five schools with 260 students so we have lot of anecdotes and the stories about what values and character kalari training imparts it is important today to scientifically study and validate those effects this will help attract lot of people to learning and benefiting from the wisdom and wellness of kalari pai 2 see uh, in the post covid world world health organization estimates that we have gone back in mental health at, le- at least three decades this is a much more serious long term impact that we have to prepare for various psychological problems people faced from the fear of illness anxiety from lockdown depression from loneliness and separation all of these have deep effect on how our lives will progress from now onwards even before the pandemic the united nations of world health organization have been urging us to move they even had bought some advertisements related how to how the sedentary lifestyle of our time is leading to serious diseases and bad health many people assume that mere walking is enough for uh, exercise but if you talk to doctors and fitness experts they will tell you that walking is simply part of being alive uh i'll this about world health organization and uh, can see 
the four kinds of exercises. For exercise to make sense, it should provide strength, endurance, balance, then flexibility. And that is what we come, we come to a martial art like calorie bite. You should understand, calorie is the combination of all these exercises. The cardiovascular exercises where we use our cardiovascular strength or strengthening the heart, use more oxygen. Then the second one is the resistance training or muscular exercises. Then the third one is the flexibility one. And fourth one is the body balancing exercise. For a complete health, you should know these four, the combination of these four exercises is very important. And calorie is the only thing which can provide these four exercises continuously. So, we are in such a world that we doesn't know ourselves much better. We are actually a learning animal, but we try to know the whole world. We want to understand the whole, we are ready to understand the whole universe. But about uh, uh, people, it's about gadgets, about feelings. We got uh, many more opportunities and medium for learning today. But how many actually learn about their own self? That is the most important learning. So how much I can understand this universe? Can we evolve more? Are we learning this? Reflecting or contemplating about this? How much can I expand my thinking capacities or intellect? So, I am asking a question. How many of you confidently, confidently say that you are breathing properly? Do you know how to breathe properly? That is the question. If I am asking this question, uh, you should understand the breathing is the bare necessity of necessity and need of life. Without uh, breathing, we can't survive. So that uh, that was I, I was mentioning. The people always say. Uh, what is the basic necessity of life? If you are asked any kid, they will say food shelter. They don't even say this breathe. So people doesn't know how to breathe. That is the basic problem. Uh, we always say prana. As you know, with each and every breath we intake, subtle form of sukshma energy is coming inside. That is the life force. Without prana, or pra when prana is lost, you become jada or dead body. Maybe uh, the awareness of the body. I'll, I'll give you a small, very small exercise. Uh, you can, you can actually, you can try very, very simple exercise to so show that how we are not much aware about our own breathing system. So everybody actually can sit straight. You hold your hands like this open and you can down your palms open down is there any difference feeling normally we as we, we, we feel that we are just twisting our wrist but I can't see you much but uh, I think you are done no? but so what I can do is you open your palms and you can inhale and you will feel that the breath cycle, breath flow is going through the frontal chest area. If you, you experience that, you open your palms and breathe. So the breath is going to your frontal chest area, right? If you just down your palms, if, if you are start starting breathing, then you should you will feel that the breath will come through your rib cage area. So you are there. Yes. If you are breathing like this, then the breath flow will come through your rib cage area. Am I right or not? 
changes. So, when merely changing the body postures, what is happening actually? The big change is happening inside. So, that we are not at all aware. That is the problem. So, we are not at all observing ourselves. That is the issue. And uh, did you heard about the term breath per minute? Breath per minute is actually the number of breath we take in one minute. Our lifespan is determined by this. You can actually check a rat has 180 breath per minute and lives for two years. Dog takes 60 breath per minute and it lives for 15 years. You can examine blue whales which has a 10 breath per minute and the lifespan of blue whales are 100 years. The longest lifespan, do you know the animal? I think everybody knows it is turtle. It has three breaths per minute and the lifespan is around 250 years. And you should understand your lifespan is determined by the breath and the timing of the breath that you are intaking. And if you should understand the relation between breath and the mind also. Because mind is controlled by breath only. In Hatha Yoga Pradibhika, it, it is said, Chale Vade Chalam Chittam Nishchalam Nishchalam Bhaved. When respiration is disturbed, mind is disturbed. By controlling respiration, we can control the mind. So, Kalaripai 2 is the basic training which where you learn the life skills. Along with defense techniques, it teaches us how to live. It teaches us life skills. Helps us towards a warrior mindset. To be fearless. To face any crisis, to lead a society, to respect your enemy, Kalari used to teach these. So, this is a wonderful uh, learning. I can say about the fearless mind or a warrior mindset. It is the, the fundamental idea that we are uh, preaching for students. Uh, we, should, we can take the word of, of Swami Vivekananda always pointed out. He says, fear is the root cause of all miseries in the world. Fear is the root cause of, of all the mental struggles and agonies in the world. So we teach not to fear. Fearless, fearlessness brings clarity to life. It brings courage to move ahead in life. Become fearless. Each practice in the Kalari brings about this fearless attitude. Pains and injuries don't bother us. It is the training for such an attitude. Let the storm come or thunder rumble. We can stand steady and fight. That is the mental strength of Kalari which, which is provided. And the ultimate aim of Kalari Paitu is to attain the great control over your mind, getting ultimate focus to life. The aim is same to control the chitta vritti, the chattering of your conscious mind, which leads to fear. When fear comes to life, miseries begin. The practice of Kalari creates a fearless mind, already I said, and it creates awareness also. It has an equal spiritual element about our consciousness. It's a path to getting to know ourselves. Knowing ourselves is knowing all of the creation. That is the most powerful knowledge we can attain. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, I think.
is open for discussion. Pranam Gurukal. Namaskar. Uh, Namaskar. Uh, I wanted to, like, since I am learning Kalari Payatu and I, I acknowledge the uh, uh, contribution that it has given, uh, provided me with uh, the confidence, as you said, uh, concentration and a lot of mental uh, stability. And I would like to take it forward, not, I'm still learning and the learning continues. But how can I contribute to the younger generation now that are busy uh, with the technology and their um, uh, services that are being provided with and not uh, putting focus on something uh, that uh, Kalari Petu has to offer? Because that, that, that is the thing that I was already trying to say. Because people are like wandering maybe in their busy life schedules. And uh, mostly in mobiles, I think the youngsters, right? So it is. It, it should be a constant process to create awareness about the fearlessness, the fearless stage of mind. You should understand the co when COVID situation came. We can actually, when we check the census, uh, the, the death rates in India more more than COVID death rates. The suicidal death death rate was the most, the number was actually is bigger. That means we are all like the mental stability of the youngsters is very poor actually. So I was just talking about how mind and body is connected. Everybody actually can, uh, they are sitting actually can take a long breath, you try for a long breath. You feel a calmness, right? So, breathe is the tool. We can we can say breathe, breathe is the control which uh, gives your mind steady. That 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 way. I mentioned that sloga. Chale vade chalam chittam nischale nischalam bhavet, which means when the breath is disturbed, your mind is disturbed. We don't even know how to breathe. That is the basic problem. So. In our education system, what people should do is at least teach the students that our basic necessity of life is brief and how to intake these precious life force from the universe should be the basic teaching. So I teach the students in my calorie how to breathe. That is the basic thing that we are doing there. When you start breathing, what will happen is the breath, you should you should know that uh, my I, I I had asked a question earlier that where is your mind? So people will say something like this, right? But mind is deployed all over your body. We have a body mind complex because when emotions come to your mind, what will happen? There will be sensations tickling on all all over your body. If you feel fear, for example. You are feeling fear, and immediately you will have some butterflies on your tummy, right? Correct? That means the emotion fear transmits a, some kind of sensations all over your body in the frontal chest area, in the abdominal area, in the face muscles. If you are in an angry mood, the sensation is different. It will be in the face, in the frontal chest, and it will be in the hands. That's why if you are if you are angry, then your eyebrows will come like this. You have a long breath. You will take your hands like this, and you will you'll be like curling like this, right? <laughs> so, in a depressed mood, there will be no sensations all over your body. In a joyful stage, the body all over your body will be sen like this sensation, which is completely sensory. That's why kids will jump while they hear some. Good news, right? Or happy, they become happy. So, this is how this mechanism works. Actually, we are not at all aware how this mechanism work, works. That is the basic issue. How can you evolve with your system? You, you don't know how to use your car. You don't know how to drive your car. That is the issue. 
first of all take uh, license for your body <laughs> that is that we teach so we we should uh, constantly we had to make people aware we had to bring lot we are trying lot of programs last last one we did a mass uh, program an anti drug program with uh, uh, 2500 students so we are trying to disseminate this knowledge these ideas to lot of youngsters we are trying and you can also try this this can be a very wonderful platform that everybody can try dhanyawad gurukul and uh, also a, a lot of us would uh, want to join uh, any one of your programs please please uh, help us in that also. you can just you can just check agastyam.com is our website you can just check agastyam.com and i think uh, many of your students are actually participating in our different different programs we have online sessions also so <laughs> It is very much possible. I, I was planning to come there, but I was a little bit busy with my movie pre-production pre activities. So I am constantly traveling. So I am for my location hunts and uh, uh, what do you call it? this composing, music composing and all that things are happening. That's why I, I otherwise I will come. <laughs> Congratulations for the movie, sir. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. I'm trying the best. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? Pranam, sir. Pranam. Sir, this technology can we see with yog darshana? Yes, because we always say Kalari Pai 2 is the mother of, sorry, Kalari Pai 2 as a dynamic yoga. So what, what is the aim to do yoga? We always think that when, when we uh, hear the word yoga, then immediately our subconscious mind will push some images that uh, highly flexible yoga asanas and all that things will be coming inside, right? So we all think that yoga is the practice of body, right? This is the concept, eh? but every yoga text, including Hatha Yoga Pradibhigya or Padanjali Yoga Sutra, always says define yoga as Chitta Vritti Nirodhika. That means it is a training for your mind, it's not for your body. You can just check Ashtanga Yoga, what is that? Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. So, ultimate aim of yoga is to attain samadhi. Is that a mental process or is that a physical process? Both. Both. Because we have a body-mind complex. Without body, we can't do anything. But hmm. this is mostly a mental training actually. Like that, Kalari, we train the, train the students to like, for example, in the beginning stage, uh, the chuvadu and all will will teach the chuvadu and all. After that, we'll start kaipur, bare hand guys. So students will start like painting their hands for for some time. They will like pain it will be pain. So in one week time, what will happen is they will overcome the pain. So if you start hitting with anything, they can block. So what will happen is there is there is a confidence will come in, in their mind. What is the basic fear of a human being is to get pain, right? We are not interested to get pain from anybody in the mind or body. That is the basic fear we have as an animal. Every animal has that, that fear about the life uh, surviving thing. It's a surviving process. So we overcome the fear of pain. First of all, then we start learning the weaponaries, swords and shields and daggers. Then we started like cutting, it will, it will come, we will get wounds and all. Within one month of training, wound is a common thing. 
in every practice. We don't care wounds, we don't care pain. So you'll be much more evolved. This process, this mental process is happening in each and every activities. For example, uh, I, you know, if uh, for one moment, if somebody is using a sword and hitting you and you, you are saving, what is happening is in each and every save, what, what is happening? You are surviving from the death process. So that is our basic exercise that we are doing. So that, that is the fearless nature that we are creating inside. And uh, maybe you should understand if you have control over your mind, everything will come online. Always uh, in Taittiri Upanishad, there is a uh, there is a context there. Prigu Valli is there, you know. Uh, Taittiri Upanishad, there are three chapters. One is, I think, Siksha Valli, Ananda Valli and Prigu Valli. In which Prigu Valli, he, Prigu Maharshi is conversing with his par, uh, father, Varuna. And it concludes something like that. When, what will you get if you, have, if you have control over your mind? It says, Annava Nannanadu Bhavati, Mahan Bhavati, Pashunam Prajapir, Brahmavarsena Mahan Kirtya. That means, if you have control over your mind, you will get a good body. We are thinking that if you have a good body, you will get a good mind. No. If you are having a good mind, then you will get a good body. Annava Nannanadu Bhavati, Mahan Bhavati, you will become a great person. Pashunam, wealth will come to you. Don't go before that. Prajapir, like-minded people will come to you. Brahma Varsena Mahan Kirtya, that means you will become a glorified one. So, keep working on your mind. Mind it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Namaste, sir. Sir. So, I wanted to understand this one conundrum that this whole the two talks have presented that we want the Indian forms of fight and warriorship to become famous and to be known to everyone else. How I understand the Western form or the Southeast Asian forms of fight or the combat to get famous is when we maintain, when we remove the sacred identity to and let it be taken up by C grade, B grade movies of Hollywood and so how do we resolve this idea that we want to maintain the sacredness of Indian art forms but if we will not dwell into the profanity of it, if we will we'll not let the video games take it over or the Hollywood movies take it over, we will not be able to make it famous. See, there are actually, there, there is two parts because uh, what happened to Kalari in last uh, 200 years we, we are examining because British actually banned Kalari because all the protests happened started from Kalari itself. So they banned. So after uh, we got independence, what happened is we still thought that our because my gurus and forefathers, like 100 year back people, they are still thinking that Kalari is something illegal, something like that. So, they are not at all ready to disseminate the knowledge. That is the basic issue. And second one is, who is the student? Who is the Shishya? That is very important. Because we are teaching about the life skills. We are teaching uh, this beautiful martial art to everybody. So, who is the Guru, who is the Shishya, that is very important. Who learns? And from this learning, what he is going to do? So, in uh, it does always say, Shishya nendru panni randu varsham paathal, arivana butti avani kirinda dhanal. You should observe a student, whether he is capable to receive this. So, if he is capable, you can easily give all the ideas. You should understand all these Chinese martial art movies. 
uh, including Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee movies and Jackie Chan and all. These movies made karate kung fu much popular in the world. That government tried to disseminate uh, these beautiful their beautiful martial art to the world. That's why it is global now. But what happened to Kalari is, um, I think uh, 30 years back there was movies, but not much importance people are uh, people even government are not much interested to create an awareness propagations and all that things it is it is just a part of something called tourism or something like that so the attitude should change but there is drastic changes happening nowadays lot of people are attracted lot of people are getting benefited i hope it will be a wonderful day is coming this is a uh, what do you call it? survival or arising or coming up period is happening for Kalari. Um, namaskaram. namaskaram. Uh, sir, do you conduct any uh, in house programs for the, especially for the kids to introduce into this kind of martial arts during uh, vacations? Sure. Actually, we have online programs. Actually, uh, basically, we are teaching more than 700 students all over the world. We have kids camps in US, we have uh, camps in Canada um, and uh, many more countries in Germany also and in, uh, if uh, you, are, uh, you are interested we can easily plan online sessions or in India we can plan some kind of offline sessions our Ashans will come there. What we had, I had done is I started training more than 25 trainers that is the thing that i had done that's why we are uh, we, we can attain such uh, number of we had did a, we did a sampradaya program that is a teachers training program uh, where i create a lot of teachers from last uh, 5 6 years so we are conducting a lot of programs all over the world by online offline and uh, even in, even iit karakpur we had done a uh, class like online class with 100 students, I think. Uh, three months we had read it. A lot of students participated. It is very much possible. So I see one more hand up. Any other? Otherwise, after that, we will conclude. <coughs> OK, so last, and then we conclude. Uh, Pranam Guruji, uh, thank uh, you for uh, erudite talk and it's really nice that now you are also using memes of cinema to bring these ideas to more people and definitely I'll try to book first day first show and watch it. Uh, please, please. Sir, so I wanted to comprehend that when you talked about the, when the colonizers came and then they tried to ban this practice but uh, with the kind of competencies which these uh, knowledge forms ha have they would not have taken it lightly and there might have been a serious um, backslash. So was there any integration of integration or grouping of all these art forms? So how did they fight against them? Or like in the previous presentation I understood some of them went into secret and still that culture continued. But throughout this FDP I got to understand that the impact was not only economic but there was a lot of civilizational plunder which they did and many of the wisdom which we lost. So how did the gurus maintain these things and how did we nurture and still maintain them? And that, that uh, part I wanted to understand. Thank you. Sir. The, after uh, British banned calories in Kerala, for example in, for example in South, because why, why they banned because lot of strug uh, uh, struggles, lot of uh, activities against British, lot of wars happened uh, from the <clears throat> base of Kalaris because Kalaris become, it, it was the integral part of Kerala actually. So it become the base of resistance. So lot of kids, they went to Kalari, they 
learned a lot of things. They used it against the British. So they banned, they seized the weapons and they made Kalari illegal. So after, at the same time, what it is happened is the gurus who tried to continue this wonderful martial arts systems teach their students in very, very, what do you call, what do you call in a secret way. They went to, they, they created some gopya calories, some calories inside the uh, sand and uh, see, like something, some cellar kind of calories they created. They went to woods, they made nila calories there. So they had tried a tremendous work to sustain this beautiful, wonderful martial art till independence. After that, what happened is Kerala Kalari Paitu Association came. We have uh, sports councils and all. So Kalari Paitu Association came. Uh, they what they started to recognize Kalaris. <clears throat> they started to do these kind of uh, martial art competitions, uh, promotions, activities, lot of things happen. And it is very much happy that uh, before five years we are now in national games. From our Kalari, I already mentioned that 64 students, we got medals in district championship and you know, like we went to state championship, we went to national championship. Just like any other sports activity, now we have sports quota, uh, this one, sports quota, uh, Kalari is recognized as a sports. So we have national championships happened, our national medal winners, that sub-junior medal winners have stipends, even like something like 10,000 rupees they are getting in, in per month for studies and even they are getting grace marks. So government started trying to maintain this beautiful martial art. Now we are tending to, um, we got this, uh, we, we participated in Hello India and we are expecting within five years, Kalari Paitu will be a sports event in Asian Games. So then people will be more interested. I think we are, we are I am also an executive member of Kalari Paitu Association. We are all jointly working to, for that dream. Ji, sir. So with this, we will conclude the session, Dr. Mahesh. And I'm sure it must, it would have been a very different session for all of us, no? <laughs> Martial arts, the other sessions, all the sessions have their own flavor. Yeah. Hmm? That's the beauty of Indian knowledge systems, that everything comes together. Hmm? Science, arts, culture, and that is what was our attempt through this FTP to have that anubhuti of everything on and around Indian knowledge system, whether it's through Rasanubhuti or through the classroom sessions or through the sessions of uh, J. Sai Deepak Ji, Tark Vitark and today Bandeep Ji. So all attempt to bring everything together. And I'm also aware, Dr. Mahesh, that through the IKEA Center of MOE at AICTE, they have received an IKEA center. They have received grants to set up an IKEA center. Let's give them a big round of applause. So the picture that you were seeing, the IKEA center, that is a grant they got from the Ministry of Education, IKEA's division of. So this is an example for all of us that tomorrow, if we want to start anything on IKEA's, whether we are from college or university or even an NGO, it is open to everybody. If we have good IKEA's ideas, you do get projects like Dr. Mahesh has just received a project from the IKS division on his work, <laughs> a project, research project. And we also get money from IKS for setting up IKS centers, IKS centers. So that mechanism is there with the government. So now we understand why this FDP is so important that with these ideas, you can get the grants and set up things. And the IKS uh, division is already there. They are partners to this FTP. Dr. Ganti Murthy ji, who has been here with us, he is the national coordinator. Dr. Anuradha is the outreach uh, coordinator for IKS. Hmm? So we are all there. So just recognize the people who are 
who have all joined hands and they are all stakeholders in IKS. So we are not alone. There are people to nourish us, culture us, take us forward, support us with grants. All those mechanisms are there. Hmm? So I just so, wanted oh, to... Uh, 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 that picture was actually my Kalari's picture. <laughs> but it was written <laughs> IKS Center. No, no, no. no. I, actually, we uh, this uh, Kalari, uh, actually the IKS Center is very much nearby. It is with the Trinity College of Engineering. We set up by IKS office there. So, and being operated by uh, Agastyam Kalari. So, we co combined, co it's a combination effect that we are doing. The picture was uh, my Kalari's picture. And one more thing, it is very much happy that we are, we are running a project actually. We got a fund to run a project, that research project that I had mentioned already. That research is going on. And another thing, the wonderful thing that we, we had done is, we had done a national martial art mail last two months back. So we uh, we actually bring all the martial art forms in India. That is Silambam, we brought the, uh, the, 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 the Dhanka, the Punjabi Gatka, all martial art forms came to Trivandrum. They performed inside Kalari and we had three venues, uh, one in Nishagandi, one in Trinity College of Engineering. Indian military participated, so it was a big event actually happened because of this, this thing. So we are thankful for that and thank you. <laughs> this is giving us all ideas and the most beautiful point that I found from the session is that if the mind is beautiful, the body is beautiful. That's yeah. so important and the container is the mind. The container is the mind. So all these art forms are actually all the lessons that we learned in psychology or in health through different ways. Knowledge is just not in classroom, but these are also ways to teach to our students, whether we are teaching arts or science and math, so many, there are different kind of pedagogies. Wonderful Dr. Mahesh and thank you thank so much. All the best to the film that you are directing and that is thank the you. reason he couldn't come. Uh, all the best to you Dr. Mahesh. Thank, thank you. you so Namaste. Namaste. So with this we conclude Neodha Kala. I hope this was good. Sciences with two army officers. Brigadier Rajpurohiji is already there with us at the back. And then uh, we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel, no? Oh, Colonel. Uh, General, Colonel General, Lieutenant General. Uh, Lieutenant General Kamaji, he will be joining us online. Uh, great stories about how the military sciences were developed here. He will be talking about sources, text, schools, and thinkers. and Professor, uh, Dr. Brigadier after that. Hmm? So, 